Hey everyone, it's um it's seven o'clock and we have a quorum, so we're gonna go ahead and call to order the February 9th meeting of the school committee. I'll invite you to uh to stand with us and pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance yes. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, liberty, justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we are we're we're down two tonight, so um, I'll be chairing the committee, uh, which leads us to we need the first item on our agenda is the consent agenda. We have minutes from the uh, January twenty sixth meeting, and also an oath to bills and payrolls is in our pack. We've had a chance to look at it. Um, is there a motion to approve? Uh, motion to approve. Motion to approve from Stacey. Second. So there's a second. Thank you, Dino. Um, all in favor? Say aye. 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 Uh, unanimous vote. There we go. The first um, real item, really number on our agenda, is here in the citizens. So I don't know if there's anybody on the Zoom, but it seems like we have some people in the room who might want to speak to us. And so we'll invite you to come to the front, please. You can state your name, Mr. Hi. Hi. Good evening. I'm Rabbi Eve Eichenholz. 225 Arlington Street in Leominster, Massachusetts. I come tonight to speak to an issue that was part of the discussion in the last meeting, which was the removal of religious holidays from the calendar. As a non-resident, you might think I have no business speaking to the school committee of Littleton, but I have been going to all of the school committees in the area. I'm up to seven in the past two weeks. Um, because I speak for both my congregants who aren't always willing to come forward and to have to publicly hold their Judaism to account for everyone else, and also for the many religious and cultural groups that have nobody to speak for them. It's really important that we get to be full people. And when our kids see their religion recognized in a public document, or their culture as important enough to a school to either cancel classes or mark it on a calendar and say, we support you in your personal endeavors, in your personal observance, it's a way to be fully present and belonging to your community. Recognizing that diversity makes for healthier kids and supported staff and faculty who aren't at odds with their work environment to observe their personal holidays. I have lots of opinions about whether that these days remain on the calendar or not. And I think it's really hard to explain to a kid why they're not being recognized anymore. Um, but I understand that 180 is a hard number to get to and lots of things have to be considered. And so I want to ask the committee to, when you're making this decision, also really look at what day-to-day -day life looks like for the kids. One of the things I heard at listening to the conversation is, well, everyone's religious rights are respected and they're not penalized if they miss school. But it takes days to catch up. And you might not miss a test, but if you miss the assignment of the big project, you're not included. And it can't just be, well, they're not penalized. We have to create a more active environment supporting all of these choices. Some districts have homework holidays where nobody gets a test or a homework assignment on the nights of religious observances. It's a great way to learn about other people's culture. We shouldn't just do what we need for ourselves. It's really important as we create community, as we raise children and support staff and faculty, to recognize that majority or minority, we can all support each other. So I hope these are things that you will consider as you look at this decision. I also want to offer myself as a partner in any way that I can help. Sent an email with specifically the Jewish calendar, because that's what I've got. Um, and I know that it's hard. I know that the DESI calendar doesn't have the Jewish holidays for the 2023 year. I'm doing what I can to change that on a state level, but I'm only one rabbi. And so I offer myself as a partner for any of these conversations. And I thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you um, for your email, for your offer, and for these comments. Thank you. Uh, looks like we have other people in the crowd who might want to speak. Please come up.
And again, name and address, please. Okay. Um, my name's Aria Washington and uh, for our drive. I'm um, Giselle Kernan, 225 Foster Street. Uh, Rachel Friedman, 1 Julian Way. Um, so we're also here to discuss the issue of um, removing religious holidays off the calendar for next year. So the three of us have worked on getting the Wally off for holiday last year, some of you might know. And um, we also attended a meeting that happened around two weeks ago at um, LHS regarding this issue. So we've been talking to a lot of students and we're planning on having a petition. But what we're hearing from majority of students is, is that to have these three holidays come off and effort to have school and three days earlier doesn't seem as an incredibly like reasonable sort of thing to do. It's really important for a lot of people to have these holidays off. Um, for example, I have a lot of friends who are Jewish and they're quite upset about getting Yom Kippur off because it's really important to them and they fast on that day as well, which means that they can't properly function in school on that day and sort of have to pay attention to everything that they have to do um but of course i can't speak to that uh, speak for them i celebrate diwali and i think that it's really important because usually because of extracurriculars in school and homework and all those things we can't properly celebrate it we only have around 30 minutes to have our puja or our ritual and so this year thankfully we we're able to go to the temple and celebrate it properly but i think that we'd be able to miss out on some of those things if the religious holidays got put back on top again yeah, and just to add to what Arya said, um, um, her, along with other students, have been positively impacted by having Wally off. And although it has only been one year, like such positive experiences around having it off, whether you celebrate it or just are getting educated on it like I was, it's really important to those people um, who celebrate and who don't celebrate it to learn about it and foster um, a community of diverse people and for people to become more inclusive and respectful to those. So I think that uh, by having those holidays off, we are showing like respect to those people who do celebrate it. And um, uh, uh, point that was um, Grace, when we did talk to um, some of the committee members um, during the meeting at LHS was um, over child care and how that um, those three days off can be um, kind of hard for parents. Um, who have younger kids um, and can't really take care of themselves. Um, but I think a main thing is that um, one of our friends, RLP, is coming later, but um, he works with Parking Rec and he said that there's a lot of opportunities for kids during those days to um, go and they have activities. And so I think that like sacrificing those three days that are really important for people um, who celebrate those holidays isn't worth, um, you know, like sacrificing. I don't know what else to say, but um, yeah, it's just really important for those people to not only be recognized, but be able to just celebrate freely and not have to worry about the terms of school or other commitments um, just because it's three days at the end of the year. So, yeah. I think you covered all the words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, just so the committee knows and uh, and the community knows that Justin and I met with the DEI club for almost an hour, it seemed, uh, a couple weeks ago and heard from um, some really passionate and well-informed students, some of whom had been for this committee before with the petition. And one thing I'll just say, is, um, thank you again for your advocacy and for, um, for being here tonight. But if you want to be impressed with our schools, um, go in front of a lot of high schoolers when they are passionate about something and listen to the, the quality and strength of their arguments. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others in the room who'd like to speak now? If so, please, what up? Just name and address again, please. Hi, a lot of fun this morning. Right. I already wrote your letter, so I won't reiterate my whole letter. Um, but to speak to what the kids talked about, I know they worked really hard last year to get the on the calendar. So have it on one year and then taken away, I think it's really hard. Um, my big, if, if you, if I understand why people want to get on it earlier, but my big complaint is the holidays aren't honored. And since we've lived here, I love our schools. My only complaint has been that when my kids have a Jewish holiday, they miss tests. My daughter had to make a three tests because she took off one day of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a two day holiday. She took off one day and my kids never take off two days because they're too stressed out. 
So they go to school the second day. I go to synagogue by myself because my kids can't miss school. They've missed trips. They've missed the pancake robot. <laughs> they still hear about every year. Mom, remember I missed the pancake <laughs> robot. When am I going to miss this year? So I know it sounds like it's not a big deal, but it is. And then um, you have to make out the test when you come back. And it's just, if you're going to take away these holidays, you need to put something in effect to guarantee that the teachers and the administration are not going to schedule things on these holidays. It's so hard. And I don't have kids on sports teams, but I can imagine if there's a game that day, how do you tell your coach you're not coming? Like they're supposed to let you go and everyone tells you it's excuse, but how do you let your team down? What if they can't compete because you weren't there? So it's just, it's a lot for kids. I'm spoiled. I grew up in New York. All the Jewish holidays <laughs> are covered in the public school system. I never had to make this decision so I moved to Massachusetts. So it's really different for my kids having to like stress about, do I honor my religion and see my family or do I go to school and keep up with my work? Um, and I know there was college um, reps that came on for both days of Rosh Hashanah. And I was like, thank God my kid's not a senior. Because honestly, I would have sent her to school because they judge you if you don't go to meet those reps. And I don't want her to miss out on that for that. So it, it just, it's really nice, at least, to have Yom Kippur and know there's one day. Because when I told my kids, they're like, that's all we have and they're going to take it away. So to have one day that you don't have to stress about. So I know it's only three days and there's other ways to get out early. I mean, some of the towns around us get out, they just start before Labor Day. And that's an option that gets us out early without taking away the holidays. And it means a lot. And I hope you would consider doing a survey because frankly, we do surveys for like everything in this town. So why not do it for the religious holidays? Because people might feel comfortable filling out a survey, but they might not feel comfortable coming in here sure. and speaking up. When other people want to get out early and you may be the reason they get out later, it's hard to come in here and something. And that's one thing, if I may, one thing we heard from the DEI club is that a student talked very eloquently about in this time of rising anti-Semitism, maybe I don't want to be publicly identifying myself and my um, my heritage, my beliefs. Um, just And everyone, I, I thinks, and, and, everyone thinks that they only want. Right. right? So that makes right. it harder. But if there's a survey, I think you might get a more honest um, idea of what 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 the community is because there may not like my kids take off Rosh Hashanah but there might be a lot of Jewish kids who never do right. so the teachers aren't seeing they can't say oh we're missing a lot of kids on Rosh Hashanah or Passover because maybe those kids don't take it off because they don't feel comfortable doing it so anyway thank you very much for listening thank you thank you, thank you. are there others in the room want to speak to the committee right now anyone on the line Dorothy no no one thing I'll say it's uh just it's, it's the, the there's not a vote on this issue scheduled for this committee tonight um, because of our committee members' personal schedules. It seems like we're not going to have all five of us here, probably not next meeting yet either. And so we're we're talking about how to make sure this is something that's obviously kind of um, sparked a lot of passion and commentary in the community. So we want to find a time, uh, maybe it's a special meeting where we can all hear. And so where there's plenty of time for us to talk to people and learn from more people and for people to reach out to us. So we encourage people to do so. Um, and we'll do our best to, I don't know if we'll survey or not, we'll talk about that, but that's, we will do want to hear from people and uh, we'll let people know when the actual vote will take place, but it's, it's not going to be And we have been hearing from a lot of oh, people. Yes, we have. I really appreciate yeah. all the emails. And, yeah. and I agree, uh, coming up here, I commend the students and speaking in a large group like this, it takes a lot of courage, um, but we also welcome emails. Um, and I, I agree, we'll decide on the, the survey, regardless yep. of encourage anyone to send email. Right. Good here. All right, let's move on then. Uh, the next um, item on the agenda are recognitions. We'll hear from, from John, our student representative. All right, thank you. Um, hello, my name is John Feldes. I'm the student representative for Littleton Schools, and I have some updates to give. Um, at the Shaker Lane, they are coming up um, on Tuesday for their 100th day of school. Um, this is the primary celebration is always an exciting event for kids at Shaker Lane. There will be a lot of um, activities focused on counting to 100, um, as well as varieties of dressing up and celebrating for the 100th day of school, which is also Valentine's Day. Um, the Shaker Lane wishes everyone a fun and safe upcoming winter break. Uh, at the Russell Street, the fifth graders at Russell Street had their first band concert on Tuesday. It was a full house in the LHS auditorium, and the band sounded great. Congratulations to Mrs. Bridge, Mr. Gansenberg, and the fifth grade music students, um, and all of LMS's and LHS's band members as well. The Russell Street is looking forward to um, Valentine's Day and their celebrations that week. Um, 
the fourth grader, the fourth grade is looking forward to um, a presentation next Friday by the Littleton Electric um, Department about electrical safety. Uh, and everyone at the Russell Street is looking forward to winter break. Uh, the middle school students performed incredibly well at the all school band concert on Tuesday. Um, on Tuesday night, uh, it was so impressive to see their improvement. And the uh, Littleton Middle School um, Student Council and NHS and JHS is uh, hosting the seventh and eighth grade dance um, this Friday at 10 o'clock. Uh, the Friday the 10th from 6 to 8. And that's at a clock. Wow. That's a little late. <laughs> it's going to cost $5, and they hope to see everyone there. At the high school, the boys track team won the league meet, and the girls uh, got second. And both teams will compete in districts on Saturday, and everyone is looking forward to the upcoming break. So, takeaways are party at the middle school. <laughs> Everyone's looking forward to break. <laughs> the track team. Yes. Yeah. Including the captain. Yeah. Doing very well. No, well done. Done. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, Kelly. Sure. I'd like to uh, congratulate our athletic director, Mike Lynn, for being a recipient of uh, District Award of Merit, sponsored by the Massachusetts Secondary Athletic Directors Association Executive Board. Uh, this award was given to Mike uh, for having made a significant uh, contribution uh, within the field of athletic administration uh, at both the local and state levels. They look for athletic directors that have been in the position for a number of years. So it's quite a prestigious award that uh, Mike is receiving. There will be an awards uh, banquet down in Hyannis at the uh, conference center on March 30th. Uh, and uh, we're just really proud of Mike, very deserving of the award. I wanted to make sure that we, I mentioned that this evening. Lots of good things to talk about tonight. Our National Honor Society uh, has an incredible outreach to our community. Really proud of, proud of what they do. Uh, they currently have a Sleep in Heavenly Peace uh, bed build on the docket. It's going to be on March 12, uh, 2023. And uh, what can you do to help? They're looking for uh, $2,500 for material so they can build beds. So in the package, we we have a flyer, and they would appreciate any uh, any donations that uh, people in our community would feel comfortable giving. Very uh, worthwhile project, making sure that uh, every uh, individual in the area, not just Littleton, uh, has an appropriate bed and sheets and pillows to sleep on. So very uh, very impressive, to say the least. We also have our humanities uh, club at the high school, uh, looking at. Uh, once again, uh, Rise Against Hunger. They're going to hold this on March 18th. And uh, in the package is a barcode you can scan and you can register and also donate uh, uh, at this site. They've been doing this for a number of years. And, and again, quite, quite impressive that our high school uh, students uh, take these initiatives on to support their community. I mean, what a perfect example of what community, you know, community uh, contribution is and being a good citizen. So very proud of uh, all of our students and our high school students always uh, manage to find things to do to, to uh, make a difference in our community and beyond. So thank you very much. But also I have one other recognition. The Linton Rotary Club has been uh, supportive of our schools for many, many years. And uh, they were actually at a meeting at the high school a couple of weeks ago now. And uh, some people from uh, Humanitarian Club and National Honor Society spoke about these projects. And uh, the Rotary uh, Club stepped up. They donated uh, $1,000 to the Sleep of Heavenly uh, Peace uh, Fund so that uh, they, they have a good start on raising the $2,500 that they need. They also donated uh, another $1,000 to the Rise Against Hunger project that's going on. Uh, we had a a kindness week at the high school a few weeks ago now, and uh, they donated, donated $500 to that cause as well. And we have a community robotics program that uh, Dr. Heron and myself know very well because it started out at the high school many, many years ago and then became a community-wide uh, club. And the Rotary uh, Club donated $1,000 to the robotics club as well. So I thank them for their contributions and their continued support. Wonderful. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Congratulations to Mike and the uh, Humanitarian Club and National Honor Society. And thanks to the Rotarians for all you're doing to support our students. 
Uh, we'll now move on to room number four on our agenda, which are presentations. And we'll hear first about school-based wellness updates. We have a whole host of presenters. Let's go get us started. Let us go get started. <clears throat> Start it off. Good right. evening. So just to start, um, can we move on to the next slide? Like Brad said, we do have a wonderful, oh, I, the slide before that. Oh, you want to have a slide before that? You did. Yeah, well, can you slide, can you go one more slide down? Well, they're- uh, With the presenters. And looking for the, we're okay. looking for the slides. I have one other thing I'd just like to mention briefly, if I could. Yeah. Not out of order here today. Uh, as many of you know, uh, there's an open house on Saturday at uh, Engine Hill. The town is uh, in the process uh, hoping to purchase this building. Uh, Park and Rec would be moving into that building if the, the support is there, the purchase is successful, and the school department would uh, be moving to the second floor of that building. So if you'd like to come out Saturday morning from uh, 10 to 12, uh, it, the building will be open and you'll have people from the school department and Park and Rec there to tour you around the building. So. If you're free at that time, please stop by. And you can see on the map of that flyer where the pickleball courts might be. That's right. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's important. Awesome. really important to a lot of people. Not me, but a lot of people. Um, <laughs> okay, so just to go back to um, presenters that we have tonight, we have Sarah Dorfman, who is um, our school counselor at the middle school, and Teresa Fiore. They are the heads of our clinical team. And then our assistant principals will also be presenting Pete Camo from the high school, Matt Lavanchi at the middle school, Andrew Romano at uh, Russell Street, and Rebecca Deacon. And then in addition, we also have Natalie Proto, who will be uh, presenting an update from representing the wellness committee. So to get started, I just did want to first acknowledge um, that it is National Counselors, um, National Counseling Week. Um, and I wanted to thank every all of our counselors for all of the incredible work that they that they do on a daily basis. Um, and also, I would like to give a really huge shout out to all of the work that everyone put into this presentation. The clinic, the entire clinical team, and our assistant principals really went above and beyond to put together a really comprehensive picture of the district's commitment to social emotional learning and the mental wellness of our school community. So just to go over what we're going to present tonight, I'm just going to give a quick update on the care solace utilization. I just wanna talk briefly about the establishment of community-based health centers throughout the state. And then I'll touch on district initiatives before I throw the mic over to Natalie Croto to give um, a wellness committee update. And then from there, our heads of clinical team are going to discuss the mental health and wellness update and um, provide some data on the universal mental health screeners that we've administered. And then the assistant principals will each provide a social emotional learning update for each of the schools. Lynn, how would you, if we have questions as we move through the presentation, would you prefer us wait till the end of each individual presenter? Does that make the most sense? Um, I think it might make sense um, to maybe ask questions after, if you have any questions about the community-based health centers. At the end of each kind of at the group. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Because the way it's going to be broken up, we're going to do um, kind of mental health supports. That's what uh, Sarah and Teresa will be doing. And then social emotional learning will really be the, the assistant principals. Thank you. So just to give a quick update on uh, care solace utilization, a little reminder of what we look at when we look at the dashboard and the data that we collect. Inbound interactions are our inbound phone calls, emails, video chats from community members. Communications saved are all the outbound calls, emails, and texts by our team as they coordinate care. The warm handoffs are the referrals from school staff via a warm handoff, and then family-initiated cases. Those are the number of community members um, looking for help through an appointment by calling the 8898 number or going through the um, unique URL that Littleton has. Um, these are anonymous to school staff and they don't show up on our dashboard. And then total appointments into care means that um, a coordinator spoke to a community member and confirmed that the family attended an appointment. The national average for someone who receives a list of resources and searches on their own is 18%. And currently, we have um, 42 total appointments into care, looking at 
April 2022 to January 2023. So that puts our percentage at roughly 43%, which is um, which is really nice to see. And so um, the structure of crisis care and the behavioral health system in Massachusetts is changing. So in January, 25 community behavioral health um, centers, they opened across the state to serve adults and youth in mental health and substance use crisis. So the CBHCs, they're hubs of coordinated care and um, integrated mental health and substance disorder treatment for mass health members of all ages as well. So the statewide network of CBHC serves an entryway to timely and accessible mental health and addiction treatment for Massachusetts residents. The centers are all designated and funded by the Commonwealth. They offer 24 seven mobile crisis services for any resident experiencing a mental health emergency, regardless of insurance or ability to pay. The CBHCs also provide a wide range of routine services for mass health members, including individual therapy appointments, recovery coaching, behavioral health, urgent care, and more. So they're an alternative to emergency department visits and they'll offer crisis and urgent care evaluations, acute maintenance, mental health and substance use treatments plus stabilization options. And they, they add a new layer of care for um, youth with, with crisis stabilization beds. So the centers that are closest to Littleton are in Lowell, Lemonster and Framingham. The centers are open uh, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and on the weekends from nine to five for crisis services. The CBHCs are also closely connected to the Massachusetts Behavioral Helpline. The Behavioral Helpline is a 24-7 clinical hotline staffed by trained behavioral health providers who offer clinical assessment, treatment referrals, and crisis triage services. So when appropriate, the helpline staff directly connect callers with their nearest CBHC, and they provide a warm handoff. So this is a significant change to the way behavioral health services are accessed. It's based on a no wrong door model. So centers, centers will work with you to get you the help that you need. And it provides an expanded access to treatment. The centers have been working on scaling up since this past July. And again, it's an alternative to emergency rooms. Um, and while ambulances won't go to CBHC, but uh, police are able to. Okay, and so the last slide for me is just to touch on district initiatives. So, um, so we are, during our cross-district PD day, Rebecca Roper offered an educator wellness workshop that focused on mindfulness. And what came out of that was staff asking for more opportunities like this. So Beth Steele and Rebecca Roper partnered to provide staff with these additional, these additional offerings throughout the year. So these workshops are occurring monthly and they started in January and they have been very well received. So in addition to that, um, we have done some nice parent engagement and education through our Parent Connections event and then uh, a partner event through Littleton Public Schools and CPAC offering a parent workshop on anxiety and behavior. In addition, we are providing some staff, staff professional development that's targeted to um, specific uh, populations of our clinical staff. We contracted with Dr. Jim Luiselli. Dr. Jim Luiselli is a licensed psychologist. He's a diplomat in cognitive and behavioral psychology, and he's a board certified behavior analyst. He serves as the Director of Clinical Development and Research at Melmark and is an adjunct faculty at the School Psychology Program at William James College. Dr. Luiselli has published 16 books, 50 book chapters, and more than 260 journal articles in the areas of applied behavior analysis, organizational behavior management, performance improvement, professional training, and clinical practice. Um, he's an associate editor for the Journal of Child and Family Studies. He serves as the board of editors for several other journals, such as Education and Treatment of Children, Journal of Developmental and Physical Disabilities, Advances in Neurodevelopmental Disorders, and Mindfulness. Dr. Lubicelli is providing monthly consultation to the district and looking at how we are providing behavior analytic services throughout, um, throughout our district. We've also engaged with Dr. Tracy Paskowitz. Dr. Paskowitz is a senior lecturer and graduate program director at the, um, of the School Psychology Program, the Department of Counseling and School Psychology College of Education and Human Development at UMass Boston. Dr. Paskowitz is a nationally certified school psychologist and her professional interests include intellectual and cognitive assessment, adaptive behavior, assessment, preschool assessment, differential diagnosis of autism spectrum disorders, culturally, culturally competent assessment practices, issues of bias and fairness in assessment, culturally and linguistically diverse groups, as well as supervision training and professional development of school psychologists. So Dr. Paskowitz is gonna be providing some targeted professional development to our team of school psychologists and our student services leadership team. So um, before I, I transition this over to Natalie, does anybody have any questions? Um, about what I've covered. 
have a couple. Sure. Um, Care solace, these numbers, that 42% sounds sounds great. Um, is that, remind me, is that only for LPS families or is it for all Littleton residents? It's for, um, oh, I'm it, hearing it, a kid who goes to Parker. I'm glad you asked that. Yes. So interesting. Um, it's for all Littleton, Littleton Public Schools, families, staff, students, and all of our employees too. Okay. So, so Care Solace has been accessed also by a number of our um, number of our faculty. Um, I also do know that the town has um, connected with Care Solace as well because Care Solace is now offering um, their program to to towns as well. So they're expanding their offerings. So it's my understanding that the town is um, is. Um, going into a contract with Care Solace too, which was that for town employees or is that, that for all residents? That would be for everybody, all, okay. all residents in, in Littleton. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, but currently it's only for people who have a connection with Littleton Public. Yes. Pre-K through 12 schools. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, and this, families and staff. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. Um, the CDHC sound great. It sounds like a good development. Is there, are we reaching capacity? Is it can they are they actually be able to provide help? Because I know one of the issues we face in the past is just there are no beds, there's no there are no appointments. Correct. So um a lot, a lot of mental health providers are are looking at expanding their offerings. They're all scaling up. So the way I look at this now, it is it is it it's better, it's an improvement. Um, it still doesn't fix the problem. Um, but one of the big problems was. Um, individuals needing to go in that were going into emergency rooms and um, were staying in emergency room for days and days waiting for our beds, which is um, only going to really contribute to the decline of somebody's mental health. Um, so it really does give an alternative to to that. Great. The only other thing is, um, I'm so glad you highlighted the connections and the parent anxiety workshop. Those are incredibly helpful and, and really just impressive. So thanks to you and yourself. We're looking forward to doing more. Great. And then CBH, CBHCs are, it's an important layer that's been created here that, that is going to provide additional support. It's, an, it's like any industry that, that has to retool quickly. I mean, this is this is phase one. And I'm confident there are going to be other phases that are going to provide faster uh, service to, to students and families that need help. So move in the right direction. Thank you, Lynn. Over to you now. Hi everyone, I am Natalie Croto. I'm the co-chair of the Wellness Committee with Meredith Perry in the high school. We've been the co-chairs for some years now. I'm also the tech systems coordinator, and I'm also on the board with Maya and the town and the school to bring staff wellness activities and events to our community. So thanks for having me. I hope you can hear me okay and I don't have to put that down. <laughs> so <laughs> some of the wellness committee updates that we need every once a month on a Tuesday night, we do have our meetings that are publicized through the parent newsletters. They're also on our website, so we're always welcome to have new people. One of the things we're working on is a partnership with the Middlesex Partnership for Youth. It's a community presentation called Let's Talk About It. We're going to be covering mental health topics with a young adult speaker, so you get the lens that way as well. We're looking at having that in April coming up, so stay tuned, that day is coming up. Some of the nutrition updates, we had Leah Botko come and talk about the cafeteria and some of the great options that they're having in the cafeteria. Have you been talking to your kids about what they're seeing in the cafe this year? Black bean burgers, whole wheat pizza, hummus, chickpeas, <laughs> all sorts of great options. They're talking about sustainability, recyclability, and their staff is just doing a bang up job. So if you haven't talked to your cafeteria staff, give them a kudos because they're really doing a great job. So we're gonna be talking about some of the SEL events that are happening at the schools, which are fantastic. So I don't wanna take their thunder as they're about to come on. Uh, the Affordable Connectivity Program is a great program that's being offered nationwide. So it allows families to get their internet at a reduced rate so we have been publicizing this as well, and it is on our tech part of the website. So I urge people that if you know somebody that is needing assistance on their internet connectivity at home, please reach out to us. We can help you with that. 
And that is me, obviously. <laughs> so some of the things we do for staff wellness, we are doing the monthly mindfulness workshops, which Lynn talked about, that um, Beth and Rebecca Roper have been doing, which have been amazing and wonderful. Sometimes we just need to take a step back and grieve and be grateful for what we have and what we're doing, all the good things we're doing. So I really think that's important to focus on. Some of the events that we're bringing back in person for monthly sessions is through MIA, the Interlocal Insurance Association Group. We brought back in-person classes. So we used to have them in person and then we had COVID that happened. So we brought back all sorts of great classes. So the latest one we're doing, obviously, is line dancing. It's quite fabulous. We have 25 people signed up. It's a hoot. It's a lot of fun. Nobody knows how to do it perfectly. And isn't that the best part? We're just having fun. So the other ones that we've done so far have been Get Fit, Safe Fit, the three P's of meal prep. We also have contests, quizifies, and more. And this whole Maya BCBS subscribers, they have complete access to the Headspace library as well. Anyone ever use that app on their phone? It's a great resource. It's free. So to be able to sit and listen to just a five-minute meditation, a 10-minute meditation, that's a great new resource that we offer for people as well. Any questions that we have for Thank you very much. And now we're going to pass it over to Sarah and Teresa. Great. I'm Sarah. I am uh, a co-coordinate with Teresa, and I'm also the school adjustment counselor at the middle school. Good evening. My name is Teresa, and I'm one of our district BCBAs. We are very excited tonight to talk to you about the mental health and wellness initiatives that we are implementing across the district. All of the students are offered tier one supports when they come into school each day. These are universal supports that are given, like I said, to all of the students that are evidence-based and align with the core of learning and the curriculums that each grade is doing. What we really wanna focus on is our tier two and tier three supports. Our tier two supports, these are secondary efforts that are applied to a specific group of students. These, are, these often involve groups and focus on more sub-separate skills. Tier three are more specialized individual programming, what you would think when we have individualized education plans, individualized counseling services, but some of the tier two supports that are really exciting right now at Shaker Lane include an exercise group that they are using for students with ADHD. Um, Anna Diadko, who is this counselor at Shaker Lane, is leading this with a few other staff. So this is targeting ADHD and sensory needs and incorporating exercise to help the students regulate their um, emotions and their physical bodies before they engage with the classes. They have friendship lunch bunches, social skills groups. These offer those individualized social connections, uh, those peer-to-peer -peer relationships that they might struggle with in a larger classroom setting. We also have our get ready groups. So this is for kids who need a little extra time um, transitioning throughout the day. We also provide consultations for the parents and teachers together and collaboration with outside providers. Some of our tier three supports also include individualized counseling services, direct and related services through OT, PT, and speech. We also provide individualized behavior support plans for our students who require that as well. So at Russell Street, um, we also um, are doing anxiety strategy, um, understanding the effects that anxiety has on your body. Um, there are uh, activities that involve emotional regulation and zones of regulation. Um, individualized and group counseling, focusing on positive group mindset, resilience, strength, stress regulation, and emotional regulation. Our tier three supports at Russell Street are individualized and targeted behavior support plans, as Teresa mentioned. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about the middle school, which obviously I'm a little bit more familiar with. Um, and uh, we 
really um, are doing an expanded version of our mental health screenings this year. Um, so in grade six, um, we're doing the SOS. Um, and actually all of our um, screenings are done vis-a-vis -vis the um, health curriculum. So the kids are taught about what anxiety is, um, about what depression is before they just, before they do the screenings. Um, we feel like it's a very important thing to really educate them um, before they take the screenings. So um, as such in grade six, um, the students participated in a 90 minute presentation about depression and suicide, and they were able to ask questions and um, our student resource officer was there, the school psychologist Maureen McMahon was there, um, I was there, and we did it um, where the kids um, only were there in groups of like 25 kids. In prior years, we'd done the whole grade at once, and it was quite frankly overwhelming for the staff, um, kind of overwhelming for the kids too. So this way we do um, five health classes, you know, one a day, and um, and really have um, intense discussions with the kids, and then they do the screening. Um, and we're going to be doing the same thing um, in March uh, for grade seven um, with anxiety screenings and ESPERT, which is a substance abuse screening. And then in grade eight, we'll do the SOS refresher and screening for depression and suicide. Um, and that will happen just before the transition to high school, which we felt was very important. Um, I just want to go over, since we've already done uh, the grade six screener. Um, so you can see we had about 25% um, of the kids screen in for depression or suicide, um, which is a lot. And so to make those phone calls with parents, um, it's, it's not an easy thing. But because we did it slowly and carefully this year, I felt like we were able to have really uh, personalized, um, very important conversations, um, both with parents and with kids, and we slowed down the process, which was great. So next slide. Just um, a few more things from the middle school other than the screenings. So part of what um, the counseling staff, meaning me, <laughs> um, does, so, um, We'll do a consultation to classrooms. So if a kid, like for example, last week, um, we had two kids uh, get into a fight in the middle of class, a verbal, um, a verbal thing, and, um, and it affected the climate of the whole classroom. So the teacher who had handled the situation beautifully asked me to come in and um, meet with the whole class um, so that they had an understanding that the situation was resolved. It was a racial thing and um, it was important to really be able to talk through that kind of thing with the kids. So um, that's one one thing that I do. Obviously, I already talked about the universal screenings. Um, every week, um, I go to team meetings with each grade level and the Unified Arts team, um, where we talk about kids' um, emotional well-being and how it's impacting their academics. Um, we do mediation and de-escalation if kids are in a fight um, and need to talk things through. Um, and at the beginning of the year, or if a new student moves into the district, um, we make an effort to pair them with um, a student mentor, and then um, also to meet me, and I get a background in history um, on each kid that comes in. Um, I also do individual counseling, and um, Maureen McMahon, who's our school psychologist, does um, most of the individualized and target behaviors, um, mental health services. I think it's also important to note, Sarah, that um, the students who were screened in for depression and suicide, because the screenings were done in a very concise, um, slower manner than we typically would, you were able to reach out to those families that day. So those parents were notified that day if their student showed signs of um, suicide or if they had screened in for depression were seen within, I believe, 48 hours. That was actually they were seen that same day. Um, every single kid that that was screened in for risk with depression or or depression or suicidality, <clears throat> excuse me, was um, seen that day and their parents were called that day. At the high school, the grades 9 through 12 were screened for both depression and anxiety. For this year, they used the PHQ-9, which is a Likert scale questionnaire um, with nine questions rating how students felt over the past two weeks for depression. Uh, for anxiety, they used the severity measures for generalized anxiety disorder. This took the average scores 
of their Likert scale responses, and this was how the students felt within the past seven days. So as you can see with this, we also at the high school saw about 25% screen in for both depression and anxiety. Um, both Dr. Tracy Turner and Melissa Benson led the screenings and these were done during the advisory blocks. Um, and these screeners were chosen this year based on the standardized norms for the temples. As you can see, I, oh, I'm moving too far ahead on my own computer. <laughs> so. Um, and so this is another, excuse me, another uh, figure that we can talk about. When we talked about the tier one, two, and three supports earlier, the tier one, that's really the base of your cake. This is, like we said, the supports that all students are going to get universally day to day. Um, this includes advisory. Uh, we have therapy dogs at the high school. There are two dog spots, two, sorry, two dogs, <laughs> two dogs now. Um, we have DCAP standards-based curriculum, and then you move up to tier two. So this would include the Carousalis referrals, our CBT and DBT groups at the high schools, 504s, MCAS support, peer tutoring, and then at tier three, this is the top tier of that cake. This is our PACE programs, our co taught classes, our IEP-based IEP individualized counseling and behavior support plans, as well as our bridge program. So our bridge program was brought in this year, and this is a re-entry program for students from hospitalizations and or treatment facilities. Um, this is a way to help the students and the families with the close support of Melissa Benson, who is our school psychologist, as well as Sarah Zagalis, who is the lead teacher, to reintegrate, reintegrate the students um, by supporting their um, academic, social, and emotional needs. Do you have any questions? Yeah, okay. um, this is super helpful and, and really amazing. I was curious about um, sort of two uh, perspectives. In, from comparing sort of the sixth grade and the high school chart, it seemed, you know, you could see sort of the higher percentage in sixth grade. And so I'm curious if that's sort of developmentally appropriately typical. And also if there has been change since COVID in what you see both in the middle school and high school with those charts. I, I really don't know the answer to that. Um, I can say anecdotally that um, the kids are pretty resilient and um, and I get about the same amount of counseling referrals as I did prior to COVID. Um, last year, I did a presentation on parenting post COVID and um, I had an advisory and I was like, you guys, what do you think? You know, do you think COVID had um, a traumatic effect on you. What was and the kids were like, you know, yes, there were there were definitely some things that um, you know we all know affected them, but um, but they also said there were some wonderful things about it. Um, you know, they connected with family um, via Zoom calls every week, and and they just had a very unique perspective that I wasn't expecting. Um, the parents, I think, were more um, affected by it. I could say. Yes, um, first of all, I think if adults had the services that you guys would provide us, this would be a such better place. You guys are doing a really great job. This just seems to be giving such good support for the kids. So I really appreciate it. That's probably a lot of work and it's going to be really difficult to work with the kids. So I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, so I have a few questions. So for the sheet or lane kids, you have like you have your tier one, tier two, tier three. How are they getting a screening? Because it seems like with the older kids, you guys are actually doing screens, but how are you guys identifying the younger kids? So I can speak to that. Um, so with our youngest ones, it really is, even with universal screeners in other areas, it is um, really teacher, teacher led. So the teachers are very into to, to seeing kids communicate through either their, their behavior. And I think that <laughs> and Michelle can speak to that a little bit too. But when we see students um, engaging in you know, behavior, any changes in their behavior, what, when we see a change in behavior, we can liken that to anxiety. So if a student who is usually like typical, active, bubbly, you know, and then we see that they're they're not so talkative, we're gonna check into, you know, we're gonna notice that as, as well. And through the SST team, 
Um, Anna is part, part of that team and, and Rebecca will talk about that a little bit more. So there are lots of students who are referred to, to be discussed through either, you know, Kid Talk or through the, the, you know, the tier two SST model, um, for either behavior or social emotional and, um, and Anna is busy. So there are a lot of students that are being seen on a very regular basis. And then we also have a full-time school psychologist there as well. Awesome. That's what that's that's great here. So now the younger guys is probably harder because you can't screen, you can't really ask them these kind of questions that you can with the older kids. Well, and it's also important um, that parents um, reach out to us. So if there are things going on with your child or a change in the family situation, um, just shoot us an email or pick up the phone and and um, we always try to meet with the kid, you know, especially if it's an urgent matter. Yeah, and that leads me to another my other question too, and this is probably for both of you guys, is how are, how are parents being integrated into the into the process when it gets initiated and then following through that process and, and then if a child is you know all the checks are you know if they're, if they're doing fine and everything like how is that progressing through and how are parents being involved and, and notified with with that progress because sometimes there could be a disconnect so are you talking about individualized counseling or are you talking about the screening process or which um maybe the individualized counseling i, I guess just yeah. if you have so the tier two counseling supports, which would be the adjustment counselors, um, those those are kind of kept in house. And if there's an issue that involves safety or involves you know anything that's like a parent needs to know about, then um, then the parents are are notified. Um, typically, you know, we're sort of um, on an as needed basis, I would say. And then um, if more in depth <laughs> counseling is needed or you know, um, some kind of medication might be being considered or, or anything like that that's more serious, um, we would either work with Care Solace and the parent, um, have the parents in um, and talk with them about it, um, have a phone call. It, it varies kid to kid. Um, and it, it varies um, depending on the needs of the family as well. They are, they're obviously always engaged in whatever when you guys find something. Oh, yeah. There. I mean, it's absolutely imperative because, you know, you can take 10 steps ahead with a kid. And then if there are things going on at home and you're not addressing that, it, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. And I think, too, that the range of needs that the students exhibit can be can be great. So we have students that they need a little <laughs> extra support from Sarah because they're you know, stressed out about about schoolwork or workload or it's, temp, you know, it's temporary, more of a. Kind of targeted strike, have some conversations, and then you know the issues results. But then there are students that are coming seeking out a lot of support, or or students that um, Sarah is seeing that she needs to see on a fairly regular and consistent basis. And then from there, students may also then be referred um, for a special ed evaluation. Yeah, and uh, the other um, the other <laughs> way that sometimes the counseling staff can work is that if a child has an outside counselor, um, but they're exhibiting behaviors in school, it's really important that we. Um, coordinate with that outside person. So we get releases from the parents. That's another way to involve parents and um, and talk to the outside agencies to sort of make sure the left hand knows what the right hand's doing. Right. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, just seeing these graphs too, you can see just what the wide range of spectrum. And you have some kids that are totally fine. And then yeah. a lot of the kids are feeling a little, may have some acute stress or depression. And then you have your kids who really need um, a little bit more focus. So do you guys feel like you have enough clinical support to support the kids that really do need your help or you feel like you're stretched thin or like how are you guys doing like so we'll say we don't eat it's it's I mean I absolutely adore my work I, I think Teresa would say the same thing and most of our staff would as well um it's just the most fulfilling wonderful job but I wish I could clone myself sometimes because um, you know, depending on the day, it can be really hard. And even, you know, 25 kids and four of them, four or five of them identify that, that as depressed or suicide through these screenings. Then you have to, you know, sit with the kid for a half an hour and you can't just be like, sorry, you're depressed. See you later. You know, you have to really talk with them and understand where it comes from. And then, you know, similarly, when you call the parent, it, it takes time and energy to do that. And that's just one, you know, five days of the year. Yeah. Um, so. And I just want to speak to the data too, because we, we also need to keep in, in, into account the, the percentage of students that are not going to identify mm -hmm. the, the ones who are going to, even if they're answering an anonymous, you know, a, like a, a, a private survey that they know is not getting, you know, shared out to their, their friends, they're still not necessarily going to self-report. Um, so we need to, we need to be very in tune to, 
being, you know, the teachers knowing the students really well and observing and parents communicating with us too, because it may, it still, even with this, may not um, show up on, on the screen. Yeah. And that just reminds me of like another question I had, which is, what, how are you guys talking about kind of if you see or hear something, say something? Like, how are we trying to engage the kids to kind of watch each other's backs? Yeah, and so kind of part of the SOS program. program. Um, if you're interested, I can send you all the information from it. But um, the FAS program um, has an acronym, um, ACT, Acknowledge, Care, and Tell. And basically, those kids hear that like over and over and over again, both from myself and from Trish Bonacora, amazing health teacher, um, which basically, you know, if a friend is expressing anything that is worrisome to acknowledge what they're saying and show that you care, but the most important thing is to tell a trusted adult. And we ask all the kids to identify who in their life is a trusted adult. It might be somebody from school. It might be a counselor. It might be the same teacher. You know, it could be anybody, or um, hopefully it's a parent as well. So um, we like to see that every child has at least one support. Any other questions? No, my colleagues asked most of my questions. <laughs> just, just a couple of comments. One, I think it's one of the best explanations of the different tiers that I've seen, and I really appreciated that. Also, um, appreciate you said we did expand mental health screenings this year um, yeah. more than so in the past. I think we've heard from the community and certainly in this committee that this is a priority. So I'm glad we're doing that. And um, hope, we hope to be able to give you the resources to do that moving forward. Um, the sixth grade numbers are 25% is a big number yeah, to is. be dealing with really serious issues. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad we're able to pay attention to it. I know it's, it's a lot of work for y'all. Um, I guess I have a question that may just be a transition to our, one of our other topics about how we're communicating that with the staff and working on kind of school culture if we know that a quarter of these sixth graders are walking around. It's a with, beautiful segue to <laughs> <really. laughs> That's what I thought. Yep. So, so that's more a comment than a question. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to move on to um, Shaker Lee with Rebecca Deacon. Hi, everybody. So um, my colleagues over here are thinking I have too many slides, but I'm going to go quick. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, oh, oh, no, go back. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to talk about little friends, big feelings at Shaker Lane. And, you know, early childhood, we're all about visuals. So I thought I would just walk you through lots of little visuals about social emotional learning at Shaker Lane. So you could really just see what I'm talking about. So excellent. So this year at Shaker Lane, um, over the summer at our admin retreat, and then reading that Michelle and I did over the summer, um, we learned a lot about the impact that just how children are greeted every single day and then how they go home at the end of the day makes a really huge impact on their own social emotional well-being. So this year we implemented all staff, and I mean all, the nurse, the cafeteria, every single staff member is is on duty in the morning to greet kids. If you're at Shaker Lane, Mr. Peter's out in the crosswalk every single day. Miss Mary's outside of her office saying hello. Every teacher, every TA, they're in the hallways. Every classroom teacher stands at the door and every classroom has a way for kids to say good morning. So it doesn't have to be verbal. They have, this is the preschool one. Um, I just took a snapshot of um, the preschool one, but they vary a little bit. Um, a lot of this started during COVID too, where we weren't touching or we weren't shaking hands or high-fiving. And so a lot of it started then and it's just continued and grown. And it's really just about building relationships with children and making sure that the kids know that we care about them um, and opportunities to really get a pulse on emotional state and well-being of students. If you come in front of Shaker Lane any morning and you stand outside, you're going to get the pulse on a bunch of kids, how they're coming into school every day. And just to have someone there to greet them and walk them down the hall to class really makes a big difference. And again, at the end of the day, saying goodbye, telling them to have a good night, it, it's it's really important. So that's how we start our day every day at Shaker Lane. Next slide. So I wanted you to see, um, talking about, these slides were actually reversed, but that's okay. So um, in the classrooms, we most of the teachers have calm corners or a break space where kids can go. You'll see that on the next slide. But all sorts of tools for the kids to use to calm when they're in those spaces. So you can see there's glitter jars that they flip up and down, the zones of regulation jars, which they can talk about which zone they're in while they're flipping their, their jar. Um, lots of visuals. They set their own timers for how many minutes they think they might need to get back to the green zone. 
Um, they have stuffies that they can cuddle. They have weighted blankets, weighted stuffed animals they can put on their bodies to feel that pressure and calm down. Pillows, soft lights in the classroom. They've been taught so many breathing exercises. Um, and then teachers and staff do a lot on reading, read alouds on feelings. Um, so those are some of the tools that kids can use. You can see I have a little friend in kindergarten who needed a moment and he took himself to the calm corner and he was using the, one of the, the, the um, glitter jars to, to calm himself down using some breathing techniques. Next slide. These are the calm corners. These are three examples of what they look like in classrooms. And so if you came to Jake Lane and checked them out, they all look a little bit different. Um, some are more like teepee-like, little tent-like. Others are just more cozy places with pillows. And um, it's a great place for kids to go and teaching them. The staff really teaches them when they need to go to the calm corner. Um, and kids utilize that at their own discourse. And a lot of times they come out of it on their own discourse after they've used a tool to help them calm down. So teachers do a bunch of other things too. This, um, this year, actually last year, we started a positive affirmation every day in the morning. Um, it's on the morning announcements. The, you know, the person announcing says it. the whole school repeats the positive affirmation. It's continued for the entire week. Um, I was in a kindergarten classroom, you can see up in the corner the other day, and they were actually doing a positive affirmation movement break with all kinds of, you know, self-talk and um, just, just helping kids believe that they're amazing. Um, classroom teachers reiterate it all day long. They really teach the kid about I messages, helping to talk about their feelings with other people. So I feel blank when you blank because, and can you please? Um, that's reiterated across Shaker Lane of kids trying to use the word I. Um, and then there's also some teachers do different things. Um, one teacher has a let's talk about a jar so kids can slip her notes if they want to have a private conversation about something. Another teacher does a, a heart box where they can choose what their problem is. Um, and then we actually have another teacher who does more of an individualized. We have a little, a little friend who has a hard time coming in in the morning. So every morning, um, this child will come in and do a feelings daily check-in journal. And then he and the teacher can look at it and, and kind of judge how the day, the day might go. So, um, This was one of the coolest things I have seen this year. So this is actually Mrs. Holmes' class. And you're all familiar with our heart jars, right? So the kids, um, every time they are showing heart, there's a heart that goes in the jar. And when the jar is full, they have a celebration. It's pajama day. It's... Uh, bring your stuffy to school day. It's everything. Well, a um, couple of weeks ago, I walked into Mrs. Holmes' class and they had announced that she filled her heart jar. And I walked in and the whole classroom was transformed into Camp Shaker Lane. Every desk was turned into a tent. She had a campfire going. They had all these glow lights. The kids worked like a normal school day, every subject, but either in their tent, around the campfire. The kids said it was the best day they've ever had at school. Um, and I just think, I, I really just want to like talk about the excitement that, that this building this self-esteem and these kids showing heart and really caring about each other and themselves and the celebration that they get out of feeling so good. Um, these kids were just over the moon to the fact that a classroom, another second grade classroom did the same thing a couple of days later. So um, Camp Shaker Lane was really awesome. Kudos to Vanessa Holm for, for all of this. Um, and then I just want to talk real quick too. It's not just classroom teachers, right? It's our UA teachers too, that are also integrated into all of this social emotional learning. And this, if you come to Shaker Lane, this is one of the current bulletin boards at our school. I just find it beautiful. The, the heart in the middle is actually like a 3D made of like paper mache or something. But, you know, art is really, and music, I think, and even physical education by right, getting their energy and their emotions out. I just think the UAs are really a special place for kids to also talk about their emotions and express themselves in like, music and, you know, like I said, even in PE class. So I just thought this was a really beautiful culminating slide to talk about heart. So um, I want to just say, you know, I really wanted this, this to be about the classroom teachers and not, you know, myself and Michelle as building administrators because this is where the hard work it is done. These classroom teachers are, are really the heart of, 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 of where this all starts and why this happens. And I wanted to highlight them and went around and just took a bunch of pictures of what really happens at Shaker Lake. Yeah. 
Any questions about this? Is this is what you would call your tier one yeah. that that uh, Teresa had mentioned? Tier one is really what happens in the classroom for for all the for all the kids. I just want to say that you've given me some ideas of things to implement at work <laughs> with my team. I mean, <laughs> iMessages and Camp Day, it's it's really amazing. Um, I hear about some of these from my kids too, but really it's amazing. I really appreciate the culture. Pretty, pretty proud, of, proud of the staff. <laughs> they work very hard to, to help our little friends calm their big feelings. So. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say my first graders coming home with her positive affirmations written on a sheet every day. And I, you know, I was asking her, you know, where, where are you getting this, this language? You know, where are you getting this? <laughs> 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 um, so I absolutely love it. And I, I just want you to know that the kids, they're loving it too. And I think they're really absorbing it. So you're doing a really, a really great job. I'll jump with that and you've given me ideas to do at home. Yeah. Maybe I should smother my daughter when she comes off the bus. Maybe she wants to. Discomfort or something. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I should ask her. <laughs> <laughs> and he's talking to the popular elementary school. Um, but, no. Um, but no, but I love that too because you're, you're allowing them to be an individual amongst their peers um, because I think that's really important because oftentimes they're so focused on what their peers are doing. They Growing up, you don't always know that you can still be your own individual, but still be respectful and polite. So I think that those are really good um, skills that you're teaching the kids to kind of navigate that a little bit. So, thank you. I would just say, I echo all this, I, I love that we're giving the teachers the autonomy to do something really creative, but also that there's some structures that, you know, they come in, everybody's going to be greeted this way. We've all seen the YouTube videos of teachers, you know, going yeah. different ways. Yeah. the idea that all of our kids are being greeted every day with that kind of voice so, makes me really happy. Thank you. Thank you. And now Andrea Romano is going to present and discuss Russell Street. Good evening, everyone. All right. I only have one slide, but I think we'll capture a lot of other things. One slide to capture everything, and I think um, we'll be able to do that. Um, so social emotional learning at Russell Street um, really is um, a build upon the foundation of the work that Shaker Lane does. Um, and without all of the work that they do, we wouldn't be able to carry on um, at our building. Um, and this really begins with um, grade two being introduced to grade three teachers in the spring ahead of their grade three year. Um, our teachers in grade three really do a great job collaborating with the second grade staff to really begin that transition early on. Um, and that carries over into the summer when Cheryl and I, um, you know, host several different open houses throughout the summer. So new students, including students coming aboard from Shaker Lane are able to um, be introduced to our building um, and really feel that initial sense of comfort um, and being familiar with um, our building. Um, once the school year kicks off, our daily um, routines really begin um, at morning arrival time. Um, not only are um, they greeted by Cheryl and I at the front door, but also by a number of other staff members. Um, this occurs on a, on a regular everyday routine. Um, and once they come inside the building, we have our school um, excuse me, school psychologists and guidance counselors, along with other staff members um, in the lobby and other staff throughout the building um, to really, um, really greet students and have a presence of adults within the building. Um, in addition to that, over the last year or so, we really were able to identify a need for um, having more of a morning, an early morning outdoor time for our fourth and fifth grade students um, as a way to have a fresh start to their day. So as other students are entering the building, um, two mornings a week, fourth graders um, stay outside on the playgrounds um, and then they rotate. Um, there's two other mornings that fifth grade students do as well, um, which has been a really positive addition to our school, um, our school day and our routine. Um, once everyone's in the building, um, one of the morning announcements, or part of the morning announcements, I should say, um, is um, a moment of silence to really gather our thoughts so that we can have a positive and productive day. And I think that that's a really great opportunity for not only students, um, but adults as well, just to say, okay, I'm going to take a moment, catch my breath, and what is the goal or what is my intention today? Um, as Rebecca was talking about Shaker Lane, at Russell Street, we also have calm spaces in every classroom. Um, and 
one of the things that's really great about that is the developed um, skill set that students coming to us uh, have started to um, develop. Um, and each classroom has their own set of routine and expectations. Um, so students really are able to utilize, um, utilize that space. In addition to that, our learning spaces um, in fourth and fifth grade levels kind of extend out into the hallways. If you've ever been in our building, you'll notice we have large, um, large table spaces and different like stools and chairs available for students to work collaboratively or if they need a quiet space to work independently, that space is available as well. Um, and that's a really um, great opportunity for them to start to build um, kind of more of like an independent um, working uh, skill set, if you will. We've also added um, a chessboard table to the front lobby, um, as well as child-friendly flexible seating in the lobby. So we also, you know, oftentimes we'll say, well, why don't you go take a break downstairs or, you know, bring a book, you can sit down there. It's just another option um, for, our, uh, for our students. And as we've spoken about before, we have our Chillville space that we utilize um, underneath our lobby staircase that is outfitted with a lot of different um, fidgets, um, pillows, there's a rug, um, coloring materials, et cetera, for students to utilize. Um, one of the fantastic things about Russell Street um, include teachers being as creative as they are um, and being able to identify when students um, need breaks during class time. A lot of times when I'm walking past classrooms or even in classrooms for a variety of reasons, teachers will be like, assessing where their students are and say, we need to take a break. And sometimes that might take the form of um, kind of like a relaxing break, like a quiet break, or it might be an active break if they've been sitting for a long time. So I've been jumping in on squats and doing lunges and all the things with students um, along the way, which is fantastic. Um, to add to that, um, sometimes those might include dance breaks. I know that um, at least one teacher in the building has um, like a, a drumming um, that they do with um, like foam tubing on the tables or on the student desks. So there's just a lot of creative um, options that are going on in that regard. Um, classrooms also have a scheduled uh, SEL instructional block that's actually built into the curriculum. Um, that time is used in grade level specific ways. So for example, um, the second step curriculum is um, utilized in grade three. Um, it also then goes on, um, grade four focuses on um, empathy, strong emotions, and problem solving as units um, throughout the year. And fifth grade really focuses um, on positive self-talk as a topic, um, in addition to their um, Box of Hope and Inspiration project that they do during the month of December. Um, one of the things that's really important to highlight is as things come up um, during the school year, as you know, they always do, um, not only do teachers adjust, but the building as a whole um, adjusts and, um, and, and really like focuses in. So for example, we identified during the month of January that the building as a whole needed a reset. Um, and so during our most recent staff meeting, that was a topic of conversation that small groups um, of teachers and staff members um, participated in to really identify what are some of the strategies that you're using in your classroom and how might I be able to incorporate those strategies into my classroom. Um, you know, we've had a lot of um, review about expectations and such in the cafeteria and other large group settings. And I think just students knowing that we're all on the same page um, really makes a difference as well. Um, one of the highlights tonight that I really want to bring to your attention, as I think you've probably heard over the last um, other meetings recently, is the incorporation of what we like to call our Wednesday win elective time at Russell Street. Um, over the last year, um, I pulled together a schedule team where we were able to identify the strengths and the weaknesses of our past schedules in an attempt to um, bring efficiency um, to what we were doing. Um, and so what came from that was our Wednesday win elective. And I brought a sample of one of the posters that was hanging up in the building. Um, if you're in the third, fourth, or fifth grade um, hallway, you'll often find a sign that looks like this. 
Um, and this just captures the different win electives that are offered by teachers and staff throughout the building um, and where those students go on those days to meet them. And, you know, it's, it's a simple thing, but it's also a really nice visual reminder for students and staff that, hey, this is something that is important to us as a building um, and something that we enjoy doing. Um, it's worked out to be a really positive experience for students as well as staff members who are not always able to collaborate together during a regular, um, a regular day. So our Wednesday afternoons for our full day instruction, um, we capital, um, capitalize on that. Um, and finally, I just want to highlight something that I believe Sarah Dorfman mentioned earlier this evening, is that it's really important um, that we all at Russell Street School believe that each and every single student um, can identify a trusted adult during their day. Um, and as Cheryl and I were talking this morning, you know, we were really just um, talking about how it's um, it's not always a classroom teacher, um, which is something that was highlighted earlier this evening as well, but that it oftentimes it could be a custodian, it, or it could be a, a prior years teacher, it could be the guidance counselor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, we're always reminding teachers to check in with their um, their classes on that topic as well. So um, that's all that I have this evening. Does anyone have any questions that I can um, help answer? Um, I was just gonna say that the win electives is a house favorite. Um, and <laughs> really appreciate uh, the complexity of recalibrating the schedule for things like fourth and fifth grade starting outside or win elective. It's not an easy task, but to prioritize sort of the kids' needs and figure out how to make that happen is, is very appreciated. Thank you. Um, I think the only thing that, I mean, everything looks great. I can told my little guy gets into Russell Street and sounds like you guys are doing a great job as well. Um, the other thing that I had a question about was the comm spaces again, because as I said, you had mentioned it as well as the comm spaces. So how are the kids being encouraged to use those spaces? Because we are so curriculum driven in, in the classes and there are some students that just sure. they at a young age feel that pressure, like I can't step away, I have to be doing what the teacher is saying. So how are they being encouraged to sure. have to step away if they're feeling like antsy or well, they just need a minute? One of the things um, that's great is that every classroom has one. So it's an actual part of the classroom. It's not an area that's separate from the space in which learning is taking place. You know, so um, in the past, you know, I've actually observed um, students, you know, sitting on a pile of pillows in the corner and they may not look like they are fully participating, but they're listening and they're observing. And, you know, I think there's a variety of ways that students take in content and listening and observing what peers are doing, um, I think it goes a long way in terms of, um, you know, gaining, gaining information. That's great. I love that all the classrooms have that. Those are a great resource. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just two things. I'm struck by the fact that, um, We've heard from both elementary schools the importance of these weighted blankets and these shared fidgets and just reflecting on how different the school experience was for kids the last couple of years. Um, as we're looking at these, you know, anxiety and depression, and we, we talked about the long-term kind of effects on kids that we're, we're talking about just how important these things are and how they were didn't have opportunities to use those the last couple of years. So I just think we need to keep that in mind. I'm also struck by the amount of tape on your thing. <laughs> so do we need to put in the budget like post the board or? <laughs> That's pretty funny. You know, I was kind of like attacked by this this evening when I took it off the wall before I came here. And so it might just look a little bit. But those aren't individual, those aren't sheets that take together. That's what, no, okay, that's all I need. Okay. Those are taped on it before I just in the art room. This is minor. So I like your tape, you're protecting the walls, and like all that, but that's yeah. a lot of tape. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we're going to hear from Matt Levandi. He has no slides. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, I'm Matt Levandi. I'm the assistant principal. Um, so much like Shake Lane and Russell Street, uh, Jason and I believe in the importance of greeting kids as they enter the school. Believe it or not, not all middle school kids are fired up to hit the ground running when they come in. Um, so you'll see James and I out there trying to, you know, have that positive. You probably see me. I'm like loud and boisterous and waving and really trying to get the kids going. You know, I want them to have a smile when they enter. Um, other things we've been doing 
Uh, we have an advisory program. So we meet twice a week for 23 minutes, Tuesdays and Thursdays. We keep those um, real small. So they, it's everyone in the school except for um, office staff has an advisory. Um, and those, so we are able to keep those numbers to 12 students per advisory. And it's really an opportunity for teachers to build authentic relationships with kids, to get them know, to get to know them on another level outside of the academic classroom. The key to, to that is we want every student, when we ask them, do you have like a go-to staff member if you're having an issue, they have to be able to identify someone. And that's what we really might get out of the advisory more than anything else. If I'm having a problem, I know I can go to Ms. Durkin or Mr. Kana, you know, and, and it, I think it's making a difference. I think people are, the kids are, are learning to connect with people outside of their academic teachers. There's some fun to it. I mean, outside of lessons on empathy and, and you know, just basic organization and, and skills you need for middle school, we do things like a, um, we had a pumpkin decorating contest. And actually that's not a stock photo um, on below advisory. That is actually a pumpkin that won the pumpkin contest. Um, that was pretty good. When the kids took it real seriously. There was even two Mr. Everhart pumpkins, um, but they did not, they didn't get the winning bid. Yeah. Um, so Ms. Oliver's class got that. Um, we've also oh, yeah. on just sorry about the advisory. I should have do they stick with the same advisory all three years or they so we did go back and forth on that. Right now they are not. We are switching it up every year. Um, Jason and I have gone back and forth, but we've made the decision right now to switch it up every year. Um the people I'm sure have heard about the tech breaks that we're starting, especially in sixth grade, no technology at lunch. Um it has very smoothly transitioned. The kids that seem to enjoy it. We brought um, Jason was playing Mancala in the same letter, same right? Yep. The other day, he gets he challenges all the kids. There's checkers. I mean, I'm seeing kids play chess. It's really making a difference. Um, so we're, you know, that, that's been really nice. We're also uh, trying brain breaks for, for most kids during the day, a time to get off their technology within the class, you know, the Chromebooks and stuff within the classrooms. Um, and like even just like taking a quiet moment, you know, in that hallway before they enter class, we have spaces in the back of the room if they need to get up and stretch, um, and even have some places where they can color if they just need a break. Middle school can be pretty stressful. Mm -hmm. um, if you go into our health health classes, they're going to practice mindfulness at the start of every health class. It goes about twenty minutes. She'll come out. It's like calm breathing. She gets them out of the classroom into the lobby, and it just gives them a moment to reset. I have tried to do it many a times. I'm, I don't know, two inches or something, but the kids are much better than me. They take it very seriously and they do a very good job of it. Um, outside of that, we also are looking to journaling. So they do that in health as well. They'll start the class off after the mindfulness. They'll write in their journal for about 10 minutes. Again, just a way to reset. You know, we do a lot of this stuff in health because they have longer periods um, and it goes along with the curriculum, which is really nice. Uh, outside of that, um, we have new seating. So in the lobby, we have the leather couches, we have the leather chairs, so classes will go up there. But also it's a good way for a kid, if they're having a tough time, to come down there and, and take a break, not having to go in the office. But they're also, we can keep an eye on them. And usually kids will just reset for like five, ten minutes and then enter the classroom again. Um, other things we have, we have a random acts of kindness club. Um, so they will, they work on bringing the positive natures into the, into the school. So you will walk around the middle school and it looks like it's just a post-it note randomly on a locker on a wall, but it'll say stuff like, you can do this, keep going. Mm -hmm. um, so they really try to spread joy within the classroom. It was a little jarring for someone in the bathroom. There was like a note right there. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but no, so those are some of the things we're doing there. Jason, am I missing anything? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any questions? No, I just want to say that it's it's really nice to sort of see the progression and the developmentally appropriate, you know, from from Shaker Lane to what I consider to be the hardest age group because I'm an early childhood educator and, and middle school is just the big unknown to me. But this um, just feels like such a nice balance between sort of where they come from in Shaker Lane and, and being in high school. Um, and just a little anecdote that we have a couple middle schoolers in my community and my kids are in Russell Street and Chicago. And so we now have a kindness club. And I heard that it was 
from the middle school. And so they're spreading kindness around our community. So just cool. want you to know that um, what you teach in school spread at that home. Yeah, Crystal Dion does a great job. The kids, kids really enjoy it. It's making a difference. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to second too. I wanted to comment on the consistency that we're seeing across all the schools. I think it's really great that it's not like they're just walking into one school after many years of, of having these kind of skill sets, that you guys are really keeping that skill set in all of the schools so that they can have different ways to cope. And, and I love how you guys have the, the greetings. I'm going to say to everyone else too, the greetings at the beginning of school is just a really great way for the kids to start the day and to have, I think the counselors and support staff too there is just such an impactful way for kids just to be familiar with those spaces. And I think that's just, and, and even for the principals and assistant principals, I think that's just a really good way for the kids to be able to connect and, and find that that person at the school and be able to rely on them. So yeah, and it's, and it's huge for me, Jake uh, and Jason, we talk about all the time that we uh, we can't count the number of times we've got a kid coming in and we've been like, all right, he like we have talked, we did pull him or like, do you want to hang out in the office a little bit? You can tell a lot when you're consistently out there and talking to these kids, like you'll see that tell right away. And yeah. so that really sets the day and lets us avoid a lot of you know situations where the kid could have a really bad day, but we're able to get them early and sort of get them the help he needs or just the ear, like the, just someone to listen to right away, yeah. whatever it is. So that makes a big difference. I think that's great. And I think just on a side note, I'm really glad that the kids are like playing cards and checkers because I was a little worried that that was something that was going to get lost to the kids' generation. So that's great that like, they have the opportunity to to play those games not on the screens and stuff that's good it is nice i've seen a number of kids in sixth grade teaching other kids how to play yeah. like chess mm -hmm. and i can kind of look over them i can't remember <laughs> thank you very much All right, thank you and now we'll hear from Eve and high school all right good evening Keep going with high school, the principal. Um, I also only have one slide, so <laughs> I feel I feel that Rebecca that we're showing off. Slides, um, but there we go. I am. She feels like the artist spicy. So yeah, um, I am very appreciative. Uh, but let us know who made my slide pretty for me. Uh, and I just had bullet points. Um, here we go. At the high school, I guess the really first thing I want to focus on is our, is our new schedule we've had for the past two years, um, which really came out of um, student surveys and feedback about student workload and stress and mental health and social emotional learning. So that was really at the forefront of our switch in our schedule, which I know I presented on to the committee a couple of times now at this point. Um, part of that is advisory. I know Matt mentioned they advisory at the middle school. We have it here at the high school as well. We, we had it before in the old schedule, but advisory was advisory kind of in name only, right? John, I'm not sure if you remember that, John, but it was a five minute, it was a homeroom. We had announcements that, but we called, we had advisory and we had extended advisory periods here and there, kind of periodically go through school year, but it was really just homeroom and, and, and announcements. We, so we have switched that. We do have advisory and or flex block every day for 35 minutes. I know you were at the school the other day. That's when you met with the DEI builders during our flex block. And so it does provide us with a lot of opportunity to do a lot of different types of things. In advisory, they are small groups. We're looking at between 12 and 15 students per advisory. And we do have, as much as possible, students stay with the same staff member for the entire four years. Really try to focus on building that relationship between the staff and the students for the same reasons that, that Matt talked about, having that ideally that go-to person for a student, but just because you're in a certain advisory doesn't mean that has to be your person, right? It could be anybody. Um, we do still have periodic advisory topics. Some things we've done this year, we did a goal setting activity with our freshmen um, during, must've been October maybe. Um, we have anti-bullying topics. We have, um, we had a, a Holocaust survivor come to speak to our grade 10, 11, and 12. On the same day, we had our ninth grade goal setting uh, activity. I'm um, trying to just, again, build that empathy for people's experiences, understanding. Um, we participated in the Great Kindness Challenge. We had our door decorating contest, which Dr. Clenchy and uh, SRO Lutzinski were kind of be judges for. Um, I felt a little bit um, sad. My, my group didn't win, <laughs> even though I thought we had a good, a good, a good theme. I had socks on to match my feet. So there isn't a peer process. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, 
Got to hand it to yourself. Um, but it, it was part of the great kindness challenge, and we had a week of activities that students participated in, a uh, spirit week of sorts. Um, we also had one of our advisories put together a random act of kindness, I guess, challenge, where on their door they had different pockets of just ideas what you could do. And we had students pulling ideas from those pockets, and if you did that act of kindness and took a picture of it and, and, and like tweeted or Put on Instagram at the counseling office. They were put into a raffle uh, for gift cards, those types of things. So just getting kids engaged with random act of kindness that was incentivized by you know Dunkin' Donuts gift cards, etc. <laughs> um, we also participated in the No Name Calling Week, that is in partnership with Glisten, um, as a way to build awareness of the LGBTQ population and, and eliminating different types of derogatory words and phrases, that kind of stuff. So we, as a school, participated in that. We are have been recognized as a kindness certified school for a number of years, including this past one. Um, so that's all part of like the advisory activities that we that we talk about. Um, we also have flex block, which is the uh, four days of the week. It's Tuesday through Friday, which you is to do with our new schedule, uh, which provides uh, a variety of opportunities for students to either get access to extra help or maybe go to the cafeteria and get, get breakfast or take some time for themselves, go to the gym, whatever, whatever really they need during that time period. We do have every teacher available during that time, every student available during that time. It's something that I, I feel has been very beneficial to a lot of students, um, or I, I would say the majority of students um, in the school over the past two years. So that's something we've had the past um, two years with, with our new schedule. This past spring, or last spring, we, we had a wellness day. It was on the half day before Memorial Day weekend. It was really a student-led initiative to promote uh, mental health and, and student wellness. We had a guest speaker that came in. We had a variety of activities that were organized really by students um, for them to participate in that day. And then we followed up that afternoon with kind of like a staff wellness day as well. And we plan on doing that again this year um, on that same day, the Friday half day before Memorial Day weekend. Um, we do have two therapy dogs in, in the high school, which you mentioned earlier. We've had Archie for a couple of years now, and now Suki is uh, our newest addition. They're they're out and about in the in the building, kind of on call, if you want to call it that. <laughs> um, you know, the students go into Mrs. Elmore's room and see Archie, or Archie wanders across the Holland's Learning Center and hangs out with kids in there. And so it's been a really nice addition to to the building, and you know, students have I think appreciated having the dogs there. We do have weekly drop-in times for students to meet with counselors. We also have drop-in times for staff to meet with the counseling staff, whether it's to discuss student issues or you know even personal issues, whatever it is. So we're that's every Tuesday, I think, is the staff drop-in days for with the counselors during flex block. Actually, really throughout the course of the day, but flex block is really a time that a lot of this stuff happens. Um, guidance seminar has been, I think, a pretty unique offering that we've had at the school for many years. It's started with like a senior seminar. It's every first quarter of senior year and then really walk, walking through all the seniors through the college admissions process and the application process and that kind of ends at the end of first term and they just started actually today the junior seminar which is starting to get our juniors really into what the college process looks like <laughs> offering support um, for the students along the way and families as well we had the junior college planning night last week uh, with the guidance staff to help with the parents and all that as well um, I think it was mentioned on the previous slide from the about the high school, but we have had a lot more group therapy sessions happening at the high school, kind of as a result of a lot of the screening that we've done over the past couple of years. Um, and that's been, again, primarily happening during flex blocks. So students don't have to miss class time to access, you know, mental health support in the schools. Uh, we have been looking at a more restorative justice model for, you know, student discipline. They had, there was changes in regulations through discipline this past November, and so we really focused on working with our counseling staff to address, um, you know, student behavior issues as well, not just looking at the old punitive measures that are, I guess, were more common then. Um, and we have had PD for teachers run by our counseling staff called SEL and Functional Strategies. That was uh, pretty well received by our, our staff. Uh, I think that's what I have. So any questions? About the high school and what we're doing. Right, I'll go first. Yeah. I'll go. That's Cheryl. <laughs> I was just curious what kind of dogs they were. Oh, um, Yell Lab. Yell Lab. Lab and Suki is a smaller, smaller white dog. <laughs> 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 
It's a yeah, it's an eight hundred. It's bigger and yeah, the bigger one. Big dog and then yeah, little little one. She wears very cute outfits. Yes, Mrs. Hudo, who has who has some well coordinated coordinated herself with the dog as well. They like parent therapy. That like parents can come and. I really appreciate it. Um, so I just had two, two more, but one question and one, one comment. So yeah. one question I had was about the SLS program that was mentioned earlier in one of the other schools. Is that something you guys went as well with the high schoolers? Um, or? I've done SLS in the past. Yeah. We replaced it this year with the uh, university beautiful training. Beautiful. So before we did the SLS it was primarily for ninth grade and then 12th grade. <laughs> and so this year we decided to get away from that and go with the beautiful screen for all of our students. It hit everyone at the same time. The universal screen. Yep. That. Depression okay. and anxiety. Okay. Yep. Um, but the kids are still encouraged to communicate, find their person, like yes. if they're they're hearing anything. Okay. Yep, of yeah. course. Awesome. Um, and then another comment I had, you had mentioned college, and all of a sudden they hear the, the breaks in my head because the kids have had such wonderful support from elementary all the way through high school. How are we transitioning them in high school? How are we transitioning them to know like Archie doesn't go to high school right. with you or go to college oh, yeah. with you or like you don't have a calm space. Right. Well, I, I think an important part of that process is as students who are accessing these supports at the high school start to transition out of high school, whether they're on a file four or an IEP or, or they're not, we have the ability to provide them with opportunities to know what is available at colleges, to encourage them to seek out uh, disability services at the different colleges and, and advocate for themselves and their needs um, once they go to college. So that's kind of one thing we can do to help them finish into college. But. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like you guys have done a really great job in uh, giving them the skill set to advocate right. for themselves. It's having that. Yeah. Having that little bubble around them, they're not going to have that. They're not going to have right. that. Right. I, I, I ideally, I'd say get through high school. That's part of the process. Like, so. It, it, IEP meetings, five four meetings, elementary school, middle school, kids aren't part of the process. When they get to high school, we really want the kids to be part of that process because we can come up with a lot of plans, but unless the kids are involved in the planning, they're not going to be able to carry out the plan themselves. And from the college side, you're preparing them to be advocates on the college side. Almost every college now is a first year seminar. I teach those. Uh, an essential part of that is this is counseling service. This is where the food bank is. This is where you, you know, this do the mental health and as well as supports. That's part of almost any onboarding at any college. You'll get an orientation and usually in an academic setting. Yeah, but, but it's great that we're doing this to repair. Yeah. I'll ask one quick question. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the clock. I haven't seen a lot about um, alcohol and substance abuse. As, and I don't yeah. know if this is the right place, but it, should, it strikes me that we haven't talked a lot about that. We, we, we have. I didn't put it on the slide, but we have brought in speakers in the past. From either the district attorney's office or MPY, which is mentioned, and we had I think the other guy where he came from a couple of years ago, the speaker from from Lowell. Oh yeah, it's definitely some type of me. Yeah, so we have brought in speakers to talk about drug and alcohol use and abuse. Um, there are resources available both with the guidance office and the nurse's office. Yeah, yeah I guess that'd be my question because there's yeah. a you get trouble. This is punitive. Don't sure. you know? Watch out for prom. Right, of course. Night, um, but there's also the hey, our kids may be experimenting and struggling, yeah. and want to make sure that we're supporting them yes. in ways that are safe for their future, but yeah. also safe for their present. Yeah, so we we brought in more like the educational piece talking with students. We've also had yeah. the more I guess the quote unquote shock and awe stuff again, like the mock, the mock accidents, those yeah. type of things. We brought in a, a a young woman who had. You know, a drunk driving offense and mm -hmm. talk about her experiences, and they're always very impactful for students. And so, we'll look to do more of that as we move forward. Thank you. And there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, an ongoing support at the high school for, for substance abuse. Mm -hmm. and John and I have a number of conversations throughout the year. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not only resources, but staff that, that support them, mm -hmm. and, uh, make arrangements for them to get. Get additional supports if necessary, etc. So it's, it's part of part of what we deal with within a high school setting. Right. We, I, I, we use the Care Solus yeah. program yeah. for that as well. We used to use the Interface, mm -hmm. um, which was had the mental health component, but also the substance component, and using our partnership with the police department as well. The, the, their, their coin database was more of a mental health as well as substance abuse resources. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, looking at their agenda and the clock, uh, we, we ask a lot of questions there. I apologize for your waiting, um, but I'm glad we asked them. Thank you for the answers. Uh, the next presentation will be uh, it's part of a review of strategic plan um, here at the school principals about um, a standard for climate and culture. Ms. Kane's up. Well,
So next we can move to the next slide. So um, just to go over, actually go back one, sorry, for the goals. So a little bit of this presentation will be redundant, but I think it was stacked. So that's why we did the strategic plan. Um, we did the um, presentation for the last day of the last one. So pardon the principles if we are redundant for what our assistant principals have said. So the goal is just to highlight them of this standard are to review, maintain, and modify protocols and procedures that provide all students and staff with a safe and secure learning environment, work environment. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about how we ensure the district and school are free from discrimination and harassment and support student wellness. Talk about the district maintenance plan and how we continue to support the district's energy and environmental conservation. So specifically to Shaker Lane, we do two safety drills a year, as does um, all of our other schools here. Uh, we've had our first one this fall. We plan another one, I think, for April. They are very developmentally appropriate for us. We don't go to the magnitude of the middle school, high school. I think Russell Street takes a, a little a step up, but ours is very simple. We actually only going to go over two pieces of the word Alice. Um, so we do that twice a year, just like fire drills. We just go through them so that kids are a little bit familiar if we had to implement that. Um, our door signage, we have put that on the doors. So internally, on the inside of our building, it says do not pop doors open. We talked about that in our district safety committee meeting um, several months ago. And then externally on the front door, it says something, I'm paraphrasing, uh, please do not hold the door open for the next person behind you. So we appreciate that, you know, hospitality, but we ask we have that sign there as well. Um, to address some of the maintenance um, pieces of this strategic plan, we have lights off, shades down, devices unplugged, shut down. We get friendly little reminders for our energy person, Dave Riley, if those things aren't done. And uh, we forward those out to the um, to staff members if they do that. Rebecca talked about all staff freeing um, the children in the morning. Um, the SEL curriculum, so I know she talked about I statements, that really generates from the S our second step program. So our all of our teachers teach the second step SEL program. So those statements are in there as well as visuals, um, role playing. In addition to that is the next bullet point, which is the social thinking six week lessons. Those are delivered by our school adjustment counselor, Anna Diadko. Um, she gives a general overview to each classroom, but then students who need more direct services because the general overview isn't enough, she pulls small groups in for that. Um, Rebecca and I, uh, last year, we started monthly classroom diversity meetings where teachers sign up and we have a book I think I've talked about this before. Um, we pick a book of the month. I think this book's uh, this month is called The Big Umbrella, and it's how a big umbrella can stretch and stretch and cover everybody and care for everyone. Sometimes it's about um, culture. Sometimes it's about um, physical disabilities and acceptance. So we kind of go, we use that word diversity very loosely to cover a number of topics with is the kids. It, that's for with the kids and not mm -hmm. just staff? Okay. Yep, so Rebecca teaches, we, I usually send it out, so I'll send it out next week. To staff and I'll say sign up for March's book month and they'll sign up for a time to read. Rebecca and I will go through who signed up and we'll divvy up who's going to read each class. Um, we also have our monthly community meeting. Uh, last month we talked about um, I don't remember what our book was, uh, but I know that our one of our compassion projects last month was to collect cans for um, the Tackle Hunger Super Bowl. So we're we're in the middle of doing that next month. We have a very fun event planned for the kids, and uh, I can't wait to talk about them. Talk about this event with the kids. It's an internal project for the kids to promote reading with a prize at the end if they reach their goal, which is going to be fun. Um, we, Rebecca talked about our weekly positive affirmations. They're also doing them in the classrooms as well. Um, Spirit Days, a way to build culture in the building. We... Um, this year, uh, a lot of teachers in one of the teams have invited families to come in and present on their cultures. So that's been something that we um, have have worked on this year. We also have two staff members that are part of a uh, district PD that's been initiated this year through Beth Steele that have generated a, um, a survey on um, to hear from families about what culture are they celebrating? What do they want to hear from us? Because a lot of time it's us putting the information out on what we assume. So these two staff members yesterday, as part of the PD, generated a Google survey that we'll be sending out to families in the next month or two to ask them more pointed questions so they can give us feedback on what they want to see from us, what they envision from us, what they want us to focus on. So that'll be um, interesting for us to analyze. And then the school vision, we came up with that this year. Um, this summer, when we had our first day back to school, we 
we all split up into different meetings. And I think it's wonderful to hear from, I think Sarah Dorfman said that she doesn't see much of a change from pre-COVID because I do see much of a change from pre-COVID. I see, and but our kids are the littlest ones that had the least amount of schooling where, you know, those kids in the middle school did have some. I, and I saw it pre-pandemic and I see an explosion since the pandemic about our kids who are just not emotionally there. They are not ready to learn. So learning is great, we'll get there. But we met this summer and we had um, pockets of teams, like six or seven teams. And we talked about what are some things that we want to focus on? We have a district vision, we have a district mission, but what are we focusing on at Shaper Lane? And it was long, it was long, it was pages and pages of this. So our leadership team broke it down from numerous ideas and topics to we are building a safe, caring and ready to learn community. We've turned that into a banner that's being printed and it's gonna be in our building. And this is what we are embracing for us to make sure that our kids are ready to learn because that's gonna help Russell Street, the middle school and the high school. So that when we get there, we can hear things like from Sarah that these kids are doing well because um, we're noticing an influx of kids with lots of emotional dysregulation. Once you get the banner, Ms. Romano can tape it up for you. I have to credit Cheryl Temple. It's like challenges. And I, I looked at Cheryl's slide, so thank you, Cheryl. Um, she had put down support students and staff with continued challenges. And I think it's, you know, just what I touched upon that students are coming in with different challenges and it's, you know, working as a staff, how do we how do we support these new these new challenges, these more intense challenges? How do we get the new strategies? So we are brainstorming. We had a great staff meeting on Tuesday that focused on this and like, how do we change what we're doing? Because what we're doing right now is working for a handful of uh, for most of the kids, but there are a handful of kids where it's not working. So you heard how Mary Ethier and Anna Diago are doing that social emotional the um. The social regulation group, the emotional regulation group on Wednesdays, they pull those. So that's one thing that we're changing. So we're trying to see what can we do that's different to help these kids. And then the next slide is kind of just um, goals to consider, continue to evaluate what are the programs, what are the structures can we put in place for the kids and how can we continue to have them socially interact with each other, provide coaching, <laughs> help them problem solve without getting so upset. Um, so that's what we're working on. Questions? The only question I had was about this this last slide about opportunities for social interactions. One is just getting them to be social, not in a kind of curricular setting. The other is like you, like you talk about coaching or structure or templates and then set is so I think of what we had last Wednesday when we had global play day mm -hmm. and some kids did great with it, but some kids did not. It was too hard for them to lose the game. It was too hard for them to navigate. They wanted their own words to follow. So it's Having the staff take the time for those opportunities when they're engaged in a social piece, how to work through it. Mm -hmm. Because I think that there's different technology for these children that was not available for prior children. And those interactions, I think, weren't there for a lot of these kids for the basics of their, their childhood, their developmental growth when they were like one, two, and three. Um, they had a different experience. So I don't think they experienced that and how to solve them. So... We're trying to look at how do we continue to give rigorous curriculum, but also supporting these needs because you can put the curriculum out there, but if you're not ready to learn, it's just not, it's not being, there's no intake there. Thank you for that. I know you know, personal, my, my Phoebe Steph, right? And so she missed the first three years pretty much for her life of communicating with others verbally. And she spent a lot of time in your building um, having structured social interactions, like basically decoding how to interact with people and it worked it, it paid off and this seems to me this an opportunity if, if our kids need that but that I've, I've seen it work i've seen it pay off um and i hope we can we can do that the kids so our need. school adjustment counselor yeah. and our school psychologists are working hard on those pieces and if i can just comment too just from my own personal experience you have such a unique group of kids because they're so young they're, they're like COVID kids Right. And they have their own emotional dysregulation. They also have parents that are really burnt out from having the kids. Personally, I mean, I had a two and four year old, two years full time reliant on me 24 seven, which is that's an experience. And it's really, really tough for parents to be able to support the kids then when they are having those problems at school. Um, probably just a, a lot of behavior sometimes learned from two years of like everyone being emotionally yeah. dysregulated. 
So you guys are doing a great job, but it is a difficult, it is certainly a difficult task. And Stacey, that's a good point because one of the staff members at our meeting on Tuesday said, well, let's provide a night for parents so they can come, we can give them these tools. And, this, and one parent who had multiple children said, that is more stressful for me. So it's like, we want to provide this opportunity, but not thinking, all right, stress babysitter. So we talked about maybe getting the National Honor Society, society and great, but it's it's one more thing, right? So we're, we're trying to provide it, but we get it. Yeah. Parents are over scheduled. Yeah. And, and so we get it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Russell Street. Unfortunately, I think I did this set of slides first because I would have picked a bunch of things off Michelle. So she <laughs> um, it's hard to come up with the accomplishments sometimes because we talk so much at these, at the, um, you know, we give so much information at these meetings to try not to um, replicate what we already gave. But in terms of accomplishments for um, Russell Street, so we again do our fire drills and safety drills and have them, you know, age appropriate for the kids that we have as well. As Michelle indicated, ours are a little bit of a step up, but not quite as much as middle school um, does. We have added signage to our doors as well. Um, do not prop the doors open in what should be, you know, like we have a couple of sticky doors. We just want to make sure everything gets pulled closed with as they should be. Um, our SEL classes that you heard a lot about um, tonight, Andrea's presentation, anti-bullying, um, anxiety, stress reduction strategy as executive functioning, things like that. Um, the inclusion of some um, health and wellness units as part of PE, um, you know, some yoga and some stretching and some breathing exercises as part of getting yourself um, ready, kind of centered and ready to go back to class. Um, the addition of the school psychologist at Russell Street um, has been an, an amazing addition for us to have a guidance counselor and a school psychologist that's with us full time. So we're very happy to have Jackie Quesnel on board with us. Um, we continue, um, as I've spoken about before, our, the universal design for learning in terms of our um, lesson planning. Um, the win elective you heard a lot about today. Um, and, and also just in terms of our outdoor spaces, we've added some picnic tables to the playground um, area. So um, kids can, um, if they don't, if it's not a child who wants to be shooting baskets or playing football, they can sit um, with other kids at a picnic table. Um, we have the outdoor classroom um, out behind the building that um, teachers go out and use with their students. And we also, um, um, thanks to, um, um, Steve advocated for this for us. We do have um, actual gates that close off um, both sides of the um, um, uh, circular driveway. So that creates an additional safe space for kids to be able to, um, when I look out my office window, there's been lots of jumping rope happening there. Um, so that creates another um, safe space because it's not just closed anymore. It's the actual gates that go across and they're closed um, at 10 o'clock and open again at two o'clock. So that's um, wonderful. I do want to um, say thank you to, um, you know, in a lot of these initiatives, PTA is there to help. I know they, um, I presented this before, but they um, helped to, uh, with the financing to refurbish our outdoor classroom. And so um, they're kind of always there <laughs> to help us out when we're um, looking for those kinds of projects. So um, I just wanted to um, shout out for PTA. Next slide. So, and again, challenges is, you know, relative. Um, continue to up, update our safety protocols. I think, you know, we as an admin team, it seems like, unfortunately, there's something to talk about every week. And so just keeping that updated and current um, for, you know, what we're presenting at our schools, how we move forward with that with kids, um, when unfortunately there's something on the news every week. Um, how to continue to support student wellness, you know, post pandemic, um, and just in general in the world, we want to, you know, as as was in the presentation tonight, um, we're constantly kind of having our finger on the pulse of what's going on with our kids, and and what are some kind of new and creative ways to help support that, and also um, to continue to monitor and support the wellness of our staff um, as well. Um, thank you, and then or um, goals to consider is just to consider post-pandemic concerns regarding stress, anxiety, and wellness for students and staff, um, really to just um, make that adjustment. Um, I do want to comment that, you know, um, I, I want, I, this is kind of a set, not a segue at all, but um, I have talked a lot about as an administrator in having been in this district in multiple buildings, 
um, how we, how I have personally had to lean on other people in this room. And I was thinking from the back table that I don't think this team in its entirety has ever been as assembled at one of these meetings. So this is pretty cool mm -hmm. that everyone's here together. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to comment on that. Um, and I also want to just make note that um, with the, um, you know, the carryover from one building to the next, a student came to me the other day and said, when is Shady going to come and visit Stripes? And so, any questions for Russell? Questions? Um, I have more of a comment or thought, and it's not particular to Russell Street, but sort of all the schools and all the presentations we've been hearing and bridging what we'd heard in the beginning from parents about the calendar and thing. And I think it relates to this strategic priority um, to to. There's to continue to think about ways perhaps that we can bridge what we heard in terms of children and families being seen and all the wonderful work that you all have been doing and continue to do around SEL and the greetings. And it's just like a very tangible example in the greeting and around the Bali to recognize this as a greeting, or I know an Eve, you know, in doing this. And so to continue to sort of expand thinking about that and, and whether it's a holiday or not, and, and that discussion is to come, but sort of bridging that into one of our goals here, too, which might be. Which mm -hmm. nice. yeah. Thank you. I'm just really glad we had a conversation earlier in the year about safety. Um, I'm appreciative of everything that people are doing. Just the notes on the door, a little greater vigilance there. I think I think it's appropriate. I thank you for it. Great. All right, from the middle school, uh, you know, it's, it's fairly similar to what you've heard before. I saw be brief, you know, in terms of building safety, fire drill signage. Uh, one of the things that happened this year is we put new locks on all the exterior doors just to minimize the number of people with keys. Um, and so I think that's going to be helpful in terms of just being able to, to track who's coming in and out. Um, and enhanced security camera coverage, like putting more HD so we're able to see things from a distance with greater accuracy is extremely helpful in, in, in addition to extra cameras, hallways and other spaces that, that before we just initially have that. One of the things that we did too this summer is um, our leadership team came in and worked on the behavioral response guidelines, the matrix for when and how teachers should respond in the classroom or in the hallways when something's going on. Um, you know, we have a lot of new staff at, at, at the middle school over the last few years. And so with that comes, you know, maybe people aren't always sure how to respond. And so one of the bits of feedback that they gave us last year, staff did, was can we have like a, a matrix, like if this, then that kind of thing of what to do. And so we met with our, our uh, leadership team and spent the day over the summer and created what I think is, is a fabulous document that really outlines so that every teacher in the building, if they encounter a situation that they're not sure what to do, they've got a document right there, right? That they can go right to so that they can decide what's a classroom management situation and when do I call the principal? When is a phone call appropriate? Just to help teachers in those moments as we return from COVID. Um, many of them didn't get the chance to really, you know, dive into those management uh, strategies that they would have in a, in a normal setting. And so I think also supporting teachers in terms of, of safety, just in how to respond and knowing what to respond to um, when those things arrive. Um, as you heard earlier, the adoption of the universal mental health screening for seventh and eighth grade and, and SOS for uh, sixth grade. So that screening has already proven to be to be very helpful and we've got a lot of great data from. All right, next slide, please. I think the biggest challenge that we're that we're seeing at the middle school and we'll continue to see are the, the new and ever-changing post-pandemic social and emotional issues that, that happen. Right. As we see, you know, I I, I was able to talk with Rebecca Deacon. Um, earlier tonight, she's describing some of the things that she's starting to see at Shaker Lane. We're starting to see trends. I think the big thing for us at the middle school is figuring out how are we going to build a, a pathway of communication so that we're not talking about specific kids, but rather just trends in this so that we can be prepared for it. We shouldn't be caught off guard at the middle school while all of a sudden, well, we're seeing this thing that has been brewing since first grade. We should be able to, we should be able to re respond more quickly. So it's really about being able to sort of look into a crystal ball and say, okay, this is coming. How do we how do we reassemble so that that we're ready to go when that when that here when that's there not on our heels? I think that'll be our biggest challenge. And we have a great staff who respond very well to these these situations. But I think the heads up and the preparation beforehand will be will be a great help. All right, last slide. 
So things that we want to consider, um, you know, providing opportunities, increased opportunities for student so socialization. You know, that's happened a little bit at lunch with the, you know, the, the removal of uh, phones and Chromebooks, but we want to increase those opportunities as well. Um, we, we were clearly recognizing at the middle school that that's just something that many of our students lack. The, the willingness to just sit on a computer or a phone or just in the corner by themselves, this is not the time where that should be happening. And so we are going to have to create that. The children aren't gonna to come together on their own and we've got to provide those opportunities. So that'll be something that we have to look at and say, how do we work that into a day where they can have those opportunities without it being forced? Um, and that'll be a challenge for us as well. And then looking at our current mental health supports. And again, getting back to getting back to that preparation, recommending changes if necessary, so we can start to see if something's working, not working, and being able to respond to that. And obviously, continuing to to promote our anti-racist and anti-non-discriminatory non-discriminatory practices. So, in a nutshell, what we're really talking about here is being able to, to see around a corner to see what's coming for us, and so that we're ready for it when the time comes. Questions? Questions? Mm -hmm. For me, the one thing I would just say for the challenges, it seems to me that this is the, we've talked this before, is it's just how preparing our students to use technology appropriately. Right. And if we're talking about school climate and respect and yep. using appropriate language and, yeah. um, you know, they're walking around with little cameras and little video cameras all the time, um, making sure that, I mean, I think this, that seems to me that that would be a, a challenge that it's not nothing new, we don't have to talk about it, I just, it seems to me that no, that's but just to acknowledge it, the proliferation of these things since COVID is something that we're going to have to address too. And I, and I think you're right. So those are things that we'll, we'll definitely add to, you know, the whole student concept as we start to move forward. Um, so it's definitely going to be having this. All right. Thank, Thank you, Jason. High school. Hello. Hello. I'll start off with a nice statement um, in honor of the evening. <laughs> I feel Keith Cabot did a great job presenting and we, we covered everything tonight. And I think a lot of this would be repetitive, so I'll be I'll be speedy as much as possible. I also have this news, breaking news just in uh, from uh, our, one of our therapy dogs. I texted the handler, uh, Jen Fudo, uh, for Suki, who's our therapy dog. We weren't sure of the breed. She just texted me back. How do you pronounce this name? Or the, of the breed, Coton de Tuliar. Coton de Tuliar is a French word or a French phrase for um, cotton of Mass Madagascar, where the breed originated. So, Coton de Tuliar. So, we have a yellow lab and we have this dog. Cotton Madagascar. Cotton Madagascar. Thought you bought it, though, so keep you in suspense. All right, so the accomplishments, what it's already been commented on the adoption of the universal mental health screening expansion from the SOS program that we had for 15 to 20 years at the high school at 9th to 12th grade. Now every, every grade is covered with this universal mental health screening. It also, as we drill down on when the counselors review the data, they're also able to identify you know, signs of suicide too in, in the process. There's a question or one of the items is sort of a, would, would touch on that in, in the screening. So. Uh, that's not ignored. So I want to acknowledge that. He also did talk a lot about the Great Kindness Challenge, no name calling week. That just happened. We did have a Great Kindness Recognition Breakfast for the door winners. Sorry, Keith, your advisory didn't win, but that was a, a celebration where uh, we had the kids really enjoyed it. You know, there was a full full breakfast put on, not just a continental breakfast. And, uh, that was a hit. Uh, DEI Club, actually, some of the members were here tonight to present to you. That's active. Um, in, the, in the last two years, and we have we had lots of fun events. This is nice to see things, you know, having yeah, back to so somewhat back to normal homecoming dance, semi formal well, our prom. You know, the, over the last couple of years, we were all we were discussing like, how we would manage that with masks. Outside, did it have to be outside? Did it be inside? So it's nice to have a resumption of our traditions and routines at the high school. We also have a unified basketball team and a unified bowling team underway. So that's been very inclusive and a point of pride for the high school. Tiger Pride Awards are things that we showcase in our lobby area where faculty can recognize students, and any staff member really can recognize a student for something kind they did or something that was spectacular, noteworthy. So that's an individual award. With, it's on a paw print in school colors and in the lobby. New clubs, just to mention a couple, and one of them is our business and marketing club, DECA. Um, 
very popular club that's now underway this year. We also have a film and book club to mention a couple others. I don't know if organic chemistry is new this year or it started in the previous year, but that's that's, Last year. that's thriving. Uh, and those kids are really uh, into it. Uh, the second annual student wellness day is planned for May. Right before more of it, Keith, I think, highlighted that. So that's exciting. And we'll also have a staff component to that in the afternoon. The next slide, please. Additional camp. We, we, this um, category does touch on maintenance and security and stuff like that. So I wanted to mention, similar to the other schools, a lot of things that the other schools have already mentioned, they're not captured here in the bullets, but they are things that we've attended to with the high school. Additional cameras is one to enhance school safety. So appreciate school committee district uh, some financial support for that. Um, collects block activities each day for socializing, playing games, but also for going for extra help and assistance and counseling support in committee clubs. Uh, strengthened advisory connections, that's already been touched upon in pre previous presentation. Uh, we also do well this day at college here. Festive Fridays. Festive Fridays is something we do among the staff. Each department sponsors each month a Festive Friday where the department members get together, bring in breakfast, goodies, coffee, juice, waters, whatever, and put put it on display or put it, put it out in the faculty meeting, meeting room and uh, everybody can just enjoy the conviviality of starting off on a Friday morning and having something, you know, it gets people together across departments, <laughs> but it's sponsored by a department. So that's a, that's a tradition we've continued for a number of years now, I think going over a half a dozen years. Spirit Weeks are mentioned there, and I already talked a lot about the two therapy dogs. Next slide. Uh, challenges, I captured this from Jason's, um, and you've already touched upon this, I think, uh, you know, responding to post-pandemic social and emotional issues. Brad, certainly the tech thing is a concern at the high school as it is at all grade levels, uh, how kids manage social media, cell phone use. We talked about that actually at the last school committee meeting, and we hope to, we intend to follow up on that. Um, but also the other thing is it would, with the acknowledging the, the wellness presentation about in the universal screener, the, you know, that percentage of depression and anxiety, thankfully the district has really supported increasing our capacity with the school adjustment council, with social groups uh, or support groups that have been formed at the high school psychologist that's really fully attended to the high school, the new bridge program. So it's worth acknowledging that with these challenges, there's been a lot of things put in to really enhance and improve the high school capacity to deal with the challenges. So grateful for that. We also want to, this is, this came up pre-COVID. We had the superintendent hosted uh, focus groups on the topic of managing as students were concerned about stress and workload. And that hasn't necessarily subsided as we try to increase challenge and rigor because that was something we sort of, there was a fair amount of generous grading that happened throughout COVID and relaxation of assignments to try to keep kids, um, help kids to manage the stress. But as we try to increase that challenge, we also need recognizing that we'll, kids will also have a, a stress response, that workload. How do they, how do we teach them to effectively manage that? Um, because we want to be a rigorous, challenging, we want to provide a rigorous, challenging curriculum that prepares students for post-secondary life. But we, one of the things I always say is that students will be supported through that. Uh, so that's something that is an ever, is an ever present challenge uh, for comprehensive high schools. Um, next slide. Uh, some revisions or goals to consider just to follow up on a meaningful connections activity for staff with the survey of students in the winter, uh, this winter. Uh, we did a meaningful connection activity where we had every student in the school, we, identified, we had a list of all their names, and we had the staff take time out of a faculty meeting to go and have all the staff go from room to room where these they were posted, I think, by grade level. Um, and they had to put a check mark and see if they had a meaningful connection with that student. This is an accounting for us to say, how we look, do we have feel like as a staff? And there were some staff that weren't present, you know, custodians and other folks and coaches that might have been able to check that box. But that allowed us to follow up and see, make sure, to ensure that the staff feel overall that the bulk of our faculty staff have a meaningful connection with each student. We want to actually survey the students on this to see if they how they feel about. Do they have, uh, I think it was Matt Levanji who said, a go-to person, um, a person they can go to with a question or concern. We want to make sure that. So that will be a, a new addition to our, we've done this meaningful connections activity for a number of years, but this is the student components new this year. We have a, we've already heard about the financial literacy period, which will be in May. Uh, 
And we have a career fair that we're planning for 2024. So that, that's a big undertaking where we're bringing lots of community members in. Uh, we haven't done that in a while. So that will be a nice uh, thing to bring back. And the other thing is the creation of a school culture team made up of students and staff. So we'll get a school leadership team, staff, together with the student council, the students, and start talking about school culture. And this is something that is sponsored by Desi. It's a relatively new initiative. And I had this little flyer here, and one of the quotes on the top I think is worth mentioning. The culture of a place is like the air we breathe. So is monitoring the air quality in your school and figuring out how to improve it. So we want to bring staff, students, maybe you have PTA join us at some point and looking at our culture as a school. And you know, what type of environment are we creating for students and for staff? Is it positive, vibrant? Uh, is it caring? I love that vision statement from Shaker Lane, you know, uh, caring, safe, uh, and our students feeling ready to learn and ready for life after high school. Uh, so that's something um, we'll, we'll, cap, we'll go back to our vision and values, and we we'll want, we'll want to make sure that we're, um, I guess, modeling that and cultivating that throughout our school culture. That's our presentation for the high school. Happy to answer any questions. Hopefully, I'll let a brisk enough clip for you. <laughs> um, I think I only just had uh, one question. I feel like my batteries are starting. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So, I'm sorry. This is going to be very articulate. But you had mentioned um, balancing the challenging of the schoolwork and monitoring the student stress. And with all of the screening that we're able to do with the kids that you guys are doing with the kids right now, are there any identifiers in those screens that's associating the stress and anxiety to academics or outside factors? Or Yeah, I think there are probably, I'd have to look, I don't have the instrument right in front of me, but I imagine that there's some things that would touch upon that. Um, the students are pretty good about, I would say overall, our, our students would tell us, they let the teachers know when they're feeling it, and, you know, feeling it, a little, the work was a little challenging this week for one reason or another. And the, the key thing is how are we adjusting as a staff to that? Um, we have some staff that are super flexible and others are really, you know, trying, they're, especially with the AP courses, they feel like they're pressured to stick to a pacing guide, and try to get kids the best prepared. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll bring that back, that question back to our school counseling staff, our school psychologist and school adjustment counselor, and ask if we have surveyed for that to see if they are attributing them to, to workload. Yeah, that's that. that was one of the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, we found when we held roundtable discussions a couple of years ago, it was, it was a concern. I've encouraged uh, the administration to work with um, the staff to do a better job coordinating when they're giving tests. Some of your tests, the kids are taking on the, on the same day. And somehow find find better ways to manage workload. I think the schedule has helped which prior to us implementing that schedule despite decreasing the number of subjects that a student has uh, yeah. I think it's had a, a real positive impact, but we still need to, to figure out better ways to communicate with, with departments to, to make sure that we're not giving two, three hours of homework on one night and half an hour on another night. We can spread it out over the week. And, right. And we need to resurrect the uh, homework free weekends that we used to do yeah. pre pre pandemic as well. Sure, we've encouraged certainly around the holiday time, Thanksgiving, um, you know, other holidays too. And I think it was brought up by a few parents, by a parent today, uh, that we need to have a conversation with the faculty about how we're managing workload around uh, the religious holidays. I mean, that's certainly they, that was if we were to go to a, a situation, a new calendar where we didn't have religious holidays. I think it was um, uh, one of the uh, Mrs. Rabbi Blon Eve, I think. No, it was, uh, Blon Blon she, yeah, she she spoke to this. He said, you know, well, let's it, it might be the rabbi too as well to say make sure we emphasize um you know the honoring of the that students have, have commitments and maybe giving a break. We could put them all in the calendar. That's something we could do as a faculty at the meeting of the school year to uh, make sure that we're recognizing that students need to. Uh, give everybody a break around that time. It, it's you know it's another way to offset if we took away if they didn't have a day off. Yeah. I, I, I'm glad you, you pointed that out because we began this by hearing from members of the community talking about the calendar decisions mm -hmm. that we'll have to make. Um, that's it's more than a, it's more than a time management decision, right? It, it really does. We're talking about culture and uh, and show respect and not just respect for but appreciation of and celebration of. Others and I think the DEI club. I've met with them a couple times over the years. 
Um, they're really forceful advocates for themselves, but also for others in their communities mm -hmm. and are really um, so darn impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of the argument that they, they shared uh, with Justin with me was that the policies we have in place about no homework, uh, they, those aren't uniform, uniform, universally enforced. And followed. And right? followed, right. Yeah. And so that um, however we move forward, if we move forward as a committee, we're to remove those, we're going, we're going to have to be really clear about working with administration, with teams, schools, that we've got to protect those days. They provide schools. opportunities, yeah. just to echo your, your, sure. your sentiment, they provide opportunities for us to build in those workload breaks mm -hmm. Um, in those homework free weekends that we just mentioned. So we'll have that conversation yeah. later, but um, glad to see the connections with that conversation sure. with this one. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thank, Thank you for you. the presentation. Great job. We are running late, but we do have a, one, at least one more thing we, we really need to get through tonight. Um, so thank you, those who've been here um, and for bearing with us. Next item on the agenda is um, school handbook update, the Snow School. Um, Discuss recent updates based for revised student discipline statutes for we'll need to align ours with the state law. The administrators would like to start their journey home. We've had a long day, and certainly find that to leave now. Thanks, y'all. And I will be um, the, the updates to the handbooks have been extended, but I will be very succinct to just give you um, a general overview of, of the changes. So. Um, the major thing that we did was uh, updated all the handbooks so that they are all now in alignment with one another. Um, they all have all of the same kind of regulatory language that they needed to have. Um, they were all updated um, to clean up, you know, names or errors with um, titles, all of that kind of stuff. Um, they were updated to align with the, the changes to the Title IX law. They were also updated to reflect the changes to 37 H and three quarters. That specific, specifically um, ensures that the principal or their designee shall not suspend the student until alternative remedies have been employed and their use and results are documented unless specific reasons are documented as to why such alternative remedies would be unsuitable or counterproductive, or unless the student's continued presence in school would pose a specific documentable concern about the infliction of serious bodily injur injury or other serious harm upon another person while in school. Um, we updated the handbook to reflect the current um, bullying plan from the um, LPS website. We um, had we updated the section on interrogations by police. Um, so this procedure means that the principal first calls the parent to inform them of the request of law enforcement and, and seeks parental permission for the interrogation to occur on school grounds. Um, the handbooks have all been updated with the current definition of bullying. All of our handbooks now include following. That's the current state definition? Or? Correct. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, all student handbooks now include the following language related to how the district ensures that it does not segregate English learners from their English speaking peers, except where programmatically necessary in order to implement an ELE program. How the district provides English learners access to the full range of academic opportunities and supports afforded to non L, such as special education services, Section 504 accommodation plans, Title I services, career and technical ed, advanced educational programs, and the support outlined in the district's curriculum accommodation plan. Um, in all of the student handbooks, we included the following. We now um, we included that 504 plans in our procedures on disciplining special education students because they are eligible. Um, we include discrimination in the harassment procedures. Uh, we include the district reference to the district school-wide education plan. We updated inconsistencies in protected categories listed in the student handbook specifically related to sex, gender identity, religion, sexual orientation, and disability. Can I just... So you're making the handbook align with the policies we've adopted over the last correct, okay. yeah. And That's specific with that, they were they were um, just some of the handbooks yeah. didn't yeah. have the yeah. um, the, the those updates. Um, we updated the definition of bullying and the anti-bullying plan included in the staff handbooks to uh, to student handbooks to include staff. Um, we added the following procedures for suspension of students with disabilities when suspensions exceed ten consecutive school days. Um, and uh, procedural requirements apply to students not yet determined to be eligible for special education. Um, and then we added the following language when suspension constitutes a change in placement. So we now have manifestation determination language in all the handbooks. Um, all the student handbooks now have the same 504 and Title IX coordinators listed for the district. 
and um, we updated the handbooks to reflect the district's procedures for the implementation of restraint prevention and behavior intervention that is um, consistent with the regulations under 603 CMR uh, 46 regarding appropriate responses to student behavior that require immediate attention. So those are those, those are the changes and, and updates so in short. What, what has happened is, is laws have evolved throughout Past five six years is we're required to put more of of the general laws that, that we follow within our schools and districts into a handbook. For years, we try to make handbooks readable and not make them too long. Uh, Shaker Rains now is 102 pages, so you can see the shift in terms of our obligation as in school districts to to uh, include more. Uh, state and federal law into our handbook. So it's a, it's a necessity, it, it's, it, it has to happen, but it certainly has transformed transformed our handbook from something that was 20, 30 pages to something that's uh, a multiple evening read, so to speak. But these are the sign of the signs. And, and I'm glad we took, we took a lot of time going through these handbooks, consulted with our attorney, and we have consistency uh, indexing is, is you know, consistent throughout each, each school. So really proud of proud of our product. It's just the, the length is, is something that we, we can't cut down. If you want to talk about tape, <laughs> it's a good thing that they're online. Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, the pendulum does swing kind of back and forth. And, and now it, it, they do want, um, the state does want our handbooks to reflect all, all of that language. You know, and... And I and I do feel like it's important for parents to to have access, easy access, and place. have that all in one place at their fingertips, so that they're able to reference it. Um, so, so, if I'm asked a question, it's my better is maybe taking a little bit too. Is it is it fair to characterize these changes that we're being asked to approve as just making the handbooks consistent with each other, mm -hmm. reflecting current staffing and position titles, and so that they can reflect the relevant laws and the relevant school policies as adopted by this committee. Is exactly. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Right. Questions? That was a very nice <laughs> question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sonny, we're, we're about to prove these long handbooks, so I, I want to make sure that I understand what, what we're being asked to prove. And it yeah. seems like we're just getting in a line and getting it in order. Um, with that in mind, I think uh, I just had one, one oh, sure, question, sure. and it's probably because the handbooks are so lengthy, but when we were talking about um, removing some of the holidays, a lot of parents were asking, what is our policy for um, the absent, being absent for um, celebrating religious holidays? And it's nothing that we could find in the handbook, but it's not, I think it's in like on our district handbook. The district it's it's, it's, it's in the district policy, policy, policy right. but not the student handbook. That's it, 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 for religious holidays. For yeah, but what our result. policy is for what those what those kids need, what the policy for that they have to give. I have them days. essentially committed to memory at this point. After all the times they're I have to check on that because okay. I I do I, you know I could be I could be have having the policy in my mind, but I think it might be referenced. I'd have to check. Okay. What's well, one yeah. of those things where we can approve if if we choose to as a committee, we can choose to approve the handbook as presented to us tonight. But if that's not With, there, and we think it should be yeah. there. We could ask. Be added. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it should be there. I couldn't find it, but again, it was so if lengthy. But no, it's it is something that would be important for. If it's not the in there, we'll uh, start. Yeah, and then you can bring it back to us and we can approve okay. the revised handbook. Or you can just simply approve for yeah. the <laughs> condition that yeah. we're adding right. the section on religious holidays into. Okay. Sounds like a motion. Would someone like to make it? A motion to approve the handbooks with the addition of the policy around absenteeism for holidays, if that is not already completed. Excuse me, can I ask you to say that a little bit louder? I motion to approve the handbooks as presented to us with the addition of adding in the policy around absenteeism for holidays, if that's not already in that. Holy days? Holy days? That's H O L Y. Holy days. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. Any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have time on the uh, next time on time for other interested citizens to, to speak to the committee. Are there any in the room or online?
Who'd like to speak? The one online. No, I'm sorry. We're good. Uh, then quickly, subcommittee reports, PNDC. Um, I don't think I have any other than, yeah, no, I don't request don't have anything. We opened high school group bids today, so that process will be moving forward. Uh, those bids have to be uh, reviewed and vetted for certifications and other um, attachments they were supposed to provide. Okay. Um, so, but that's in progress. So, right. Thank you. Budget subcommittee? They're not here. They're not here. <laughs> They're here. We, uh, so, um, I hear nothing from <laughs> Jen and Justin. Policy subcommittee. Um, We've had a tough time finding a time to meet, but we're going to meet soon. Um, any further business? We're good. I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Okay. Okay. Motion is um, made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.